It's time for Windows Weekly with Paul Therott and Mary Jo Foley. We've got a big show for you. We'll uncover the mystery of why there were no patches on Patch Tuesday, why there's Building 42 but no Building 41, <laughs> and a tech support story going back to the days when Bill Gates still answered the phone. It's all coming up next on Windows Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Windows Weekly is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and once again, time for Twit's audience survey. We'd really like to hear from you. It's only going to take a couple of minutes, really. That's all. Just go to twit.tv slash survey and let us know what you think. Your anonymous feedback will help us make Twit even better. And thanks for your continued support. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Therott and Mary Jo Foley. Episode 505, recorded Wednesday, February 15th, 2017. PocketPaul.com. Windows Weekly is brought to you by Curry, a real live robot with a great personality. Curry is available for pre order now at acurry.com. That's H E Y K U R I.com. And by Rocket Mortgage from Quicken Loans. When it comes to the big decision of choosing a mortgage lender, work with one that has your best interest in mind. Use Rocket Mortgage for a transparent, trustworthy home loan process that's completely online at quickenloans.com slash windows. And by Amazon Web Services. For companies to succeed today, they need a range of tools that most cloud vendors just don't offer. Amazon Web Services, the leading cloud service provider, listens to builders, offering more solutions than any other cloud provider. Check out podcast.aws and see how AWS lets builders build. Time for Windows Weekly, the show where we talk about Windows Weekly every week on the week on Wednesday, on hump day. It's halfway through the week. Uh, except for me, because I, I work on the weekends. Paul Therott is here. He works every minute of every day, putting up fine content at therott.com, T-H-U-R-O, double good.com. I love that. <laughs> he oh, loves man. it, too. You really, you've, started, you've started something. It's a, it's a, <laughs> it's a meme. Yep. It's a meme. Mary Jo Foley's here. All About Microsoft is her home, allaboutmicrosoft.com on the ZDNet. And together, they represent... The power couple in lollipop Windows journalism. Kids. What? <laughs> the lollipop kids. They represent <laughs> the lollipop league. Is it guild or league? No, oh, actually, I think it's guild. I think it's guild, and I think I know I I know that because I lost a trivia contest because I put league. Yeah, mm. and they said I can't said give kids, the points. but I think it's guild. Yeah, I think, I think it's, it's guild. guild. I thought it was kids. It's not kids, huh? God, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I don't really care. Yep. Uh, you can bing it. <clears throat> this you say you have big announcements. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's been kind of a week of announcements, wouldn't you say? It has, it has. Like, yeah. um, well, okay, <laughs> like what? Such as, such as, <laughs> get, fill us in, Mary Jo. Okay, I'll I'll take a stab at the first one, even though I wasn't there when it was announced. Uh, so so yesterday at Microsoft Ignite in Australia, they announced that they're going to have a special. Windows Insider Program for Businesses, and they're calling it WIP4, the number four, biz. So Windows Insider Program for Business. And <laughs> oh, <laughs> this boy. is an interesting announcement because I, I kind of felt like the Windows Insider Program as it exists today also included business customers. Like they were encouraging businesses to have at least some of their people in there uh, so that they could do some early piloting of these versions of Windows as they were being tested. But it sounds like Microsoft thinks they need to double down on that and make something very specific for the business customer. So they, they said the details will be coming um, in the coming months, like they always love to say. Uh, but they're going to be talking about things like how to onboard more business customers into the insider program, how to give them more tools to make it easier for them to deploy these insider builds. And ultimately, I would think the final builds to their users, they're going to give them ser more surveys, more tools um, for analyzing what's going on with the different builds, it looks like. 
And I think the the idea is they want to turn this into more of a community because right now, IT pros who are in the insider program, they're just any other insider. So I feel like they're trying to make kind of a special side community for IT pros who are insiders. I don't know. That's as much about as we know about this, right? <laughs> yeah. So the funny thing is when this came up, uh, as I was saying to Mary Jo earlier, privately, I'm positive that Donna Sarkar said something about this to me last year. And I went and looked at my notes and I looked at what I wrote at the time and I, I don't see it. But the way I recall it being described, and maybe it was a fever dream for all I know, <laughs> was that, you know, my, uh, corporations with policy can uh, put users into different groups and that, you know, they would be able to assign a group of users to different rings of the insider program, which, you know, makes sense in the sense that that would work and all that. But I have to wonder why on earth... Any insider, uh, any business would ever put a group of users into the insider program. I mean, it's by nature kind of buggy and problematic. And it seems like businesses, IT pros, you know, or IT groups and businesses are, are spending all of their time fix, you know, putting out fires and fixing problems. And I, I, it seems odd to me that there is any group, like large group of business customers that think this is a great idea. Although, you know, if you're okay. if you're a business, though, you're you probably do want to have some input into features yeah. that are specific for businesses as they're being built, right? Maybe. Uh, I mean, Maybe. I, yes. I, okay, I'd say yeah. no. Yes, of, of course. But it seems like businesses are always a step behind, anyway, right? I mean, most businesses mm. are still on Windows Seven, and I, True. it just I, they, this is not an audience that moves quickly to the new stuff, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you I know, don't know. But, um, yeah, Barb Bowman asked me on Twitter today, she said, so what's the difference between this and the TAP, you know, technology adoption program, which a lot of businesses mm -hmm. are already in for Windows? And I said, right. I don't know. Good question. Good question. <laughs> We'd like yep. to know, but we don't know yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, hmm. yeah so I, I think it's going to be interesting to see if this catches on and kind of how this for business part differs from the regular insider program? Like, are there different kinds of rings? Or because right, we need more are they rings. The same? Right. It Maybe they're going to be like the Xbox rings. Don't they? I mean, <laughs> if you're, they must have some plan for IT folks who want to vet updates or vet versions of Windows before they roll them out. Yeah. Enterprise wide. Windows 8. Does, <laughs> <laughs> but does that, I mean, is that, that that exists in some form or fashion, right? Mm. So does that, yeah. is this, yeah. what's it called? Yeah, I mean, well, no, it's just a feed. It, it, so how would well, this differ from that? This is, so you can be a, yeah, an insider or? Well, yeah, you can, yeah. you can just as part of deploying Windows 10 to vet updates, right? As a business, if you yeah. Yeah. opt in, you know, you have to use Windows Enterprise Edition, you yeah. can stay a version behind, two versions behind, whatever. Um. I, yeah, it's it's confusing um, hmm. how this really fits in with the other stuff, and I, maybe maybe that's the point. You know, they were saying we're going to have more details in the coming months. Maybe the way that this fits in is going to obviate the need for something else, and maybe that's how this wow. is going to progress. Yeah. Okay. It's really not very clear. No, it isn't. No. No, but it is um, you know, a, a few people have pointed out that. There, there were some features that have come out in other versions of Windows 10 as they've been being built that you kind of wish had had more hands-on time by business users. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, that's an interesting. You know what uh, I mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, so well, this could be a way. Is a, is a new example of that. I mean, there's a lot of right. stuff. Yep. Yep. yep, yep. I mean, it, it feels like some of the bugs that got through that they patched after different versions came out. You you wonder like, okay, why didn't more people test this combination of things mm -hmm, together? Mm -hmm. So maybe that's what it's for too. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. But if you, if you do want to participate, if you think you're interested in seeing what this is about, you can go to insider.windows.com slash home slash IT pro and fill out a short survey. And, what does it and say? And potentially be accepted in or... Is it yeah, automatic? I wonder if it's like that too, or if it's right. just something you would sign up for. Yep. Um, I don't know. No, 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 no. A lot of don't know so far. Do but not know. Yeah. Okay. But it's coming. Here it comes. <laughs> IT, IT Pro TV might be mad at the name. 
or they mm-hmm. haven't named it. Is it? They haven't named. It's not called. It's IT just called Pro. WIP for Biz. Oh, okay. So far, Whip Biz. Yeah. yeah. Whip Biz. Whip Biz. Call it Whip Biz. <laughs> whip, uh, whip it good. Whip it good. Build is coming. Yeah. So we have um, we have our traditions mm-hmm. in the Microsoft space. Um, Every year, Microsoft announces that build registration is open, and every year, no one can register, and then it sells out. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. <laughs> and, uh, I, I wanted to do that. <laughs> yeah. This year was a little more painful than usual because build is later in the year, so the registration was later. I think than usual people were starting to freak a little bit. Um, and uh, if you missed it, mm. is it too late? It's over? Yep. Oh. No, but don't you go on a waiting list? And a lot of people last year got in from the waiting list too, didn't they? Yeah, yeah I think that's true. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it, uh, I don't remember the exact error message I got yesterday, but when I tried to register it, <laughs> uh, which I don't have to do, I just wanted to see what it was like because I, I know yeah. the hilarity that will be ensuing. Uh, I, 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 you don't often get to see plain text pages on the web, but when you do, <laughs> they're usually error messages. Yeah. And it's usually because some kind of a server has crashed and that's what happened. Uh, but this year, it's going to be in Seattle. Mm-hmm. It's May 10th through 12th, not in San Francisco this year. Um, what else? It's at the Washington State Convention Center. There's going. There are going to be 5,000 people allowed at Build. Which, by the way, is interesting because they always and sell it. out. The past several shows have been 5,000 people in San Francisco at Moscone West, I think it's called, mm-hmm. uh, which is probably as much as that place can hold. Um, the Washington State Convention Center can hold 10,000 people. So yeah. let's make but, it bigger. Well, yeah, that's what Steve I, yeah. Guggenheimer, um, who is one of the main movers and shakers of Build, said yesterday on Twitter, we asked mm-hmm. for more um, space, but we didn't get it this time, but maybe next time. So, Oh, interesting. So maybe there's tried. something else there. They or, tried to do it. Yeah. Okay. Yep. We don't know what the sessions years, are. But- yeah, yeah no, I've no. I've been there a couple times. Um, yeah, me we don't too, know but the not sessions, recently. right? No, not yeah. recently. What does it say here? Um, it says on the site now you'll be hearing from leaders like Scott Guthrie and Scott Hanselman. Oh no, that just says a dev intersection doesn't say a build. So yeah, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know we'll who the keynoters are. But likely those guys. Um, <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> And they, they, when they were teasing registration for the show, it was interesting to see what they talked up on that list of things because they definitely right. didn't talk up Windows that much. They talked up more things like yeah. AI and building uh, virtual reality and augmented reality applications, mm-hmm. which is part of Windows. But I mean, they didn't say like, hey, we're going to talk more about Redstone 3, which maybe they will because of the yeah, timing. I would, I would think so. Yeah, me too. Um, are there hardware giveaways? We don't know. There have not been the past couple years at Build, but we don't know for sure count yet. On it. I wouldn't count on it either. But you know, I I think we talked about this probably last year and maybe the year before. What they should be doing is giving away Azure credits and mm-hmm. doing everything they can to drive developer usage of the cloud stuff. And there's no reason they can't do that. Mm-hmm. Um, so hopefully that happens. I bet we'll hear more about bots again this year, probably. Sure. Develop the bot developer framework like we did last year. Probably more on like cognitive services and the different AI services they're building on Azure. Pretty safe bet. What else? We don't know. We'll see. Yeah. So when is it? This show's in what, mid to late May, basically. Yeah. Middle of May. So. Yeah, I mean, it's about a month and a half later than usual, which is interesting mm-hmm. timing. I, and I don't know if that's just because of the availability of the venue or if they wanted to wait for certain things to have happened. Um, right. So, we'll, yeah, like I said, we'll have to wait and see what the actual topics are. Mm-hmm. But we'll be there. There probably will be a meetup, it's safe to say. Yeah, and we'll be in Seattle this year, uh, yeah, I would imagine, be right? Given, because yeah. everyone's going to mm-hmm. be over there. Nice. Yeah. That'll be fun. <laughs> yeah. There's always good Maybe beer. Maybe you can come, Leo. No. Maybe when is it again? <laughs> May 10th through 12th. May. They have, I'm pretty sure they, I'm they doing sh- something then. 
They must. <laughs> they must <laughs> wow. <laughs> it might be three of the sunny days they get every year. Um, it might be. Yeah. Yeah. You know. I, you know come. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. It's such a short flight for you. It would be easy. Yeah. In fact, I think mm -hmm. we have a direct flight to Seattle from uh, Santa Rosa, just up the road. A piece. Oh. So really, there'd be no excuse not to go. Sure. <laughs> Damn <Right>. it. <laughs> <laughs> There's no excuse. Nothing occurs, but give it time, Leo. Yeah, I'll come up with yeah. something. <laughs> Some <laughs> reason. Uh, not th it's not that I don't want to see you guys. That's not it at yeah, all. I, I didn't mm. take it that way. No. I did. I took it that way. Oh, please. <laughs> Love seeing you no. guys. I just, Come you know, on. a trip to Seattle. You just don't Seattle. want to hear about bots sure. and APIs. I, Bill, and this kind of actually would be, actually, of all the Microsoft conferences, that's probably the one I'd be most interested in. Yeah. 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 Keep saying that, Leah. Yeah. <laughs> There'll be uh, some bash stuff. It will be good for you. Bash. Will there be bash? <laughs> oh, that's different. There there's, will. If there's Linux content, I'm I'm in. You know how to you know, compile in GCC inside of Bash. It's it's <laughs> oh, nice. Mm -hmm. Maybe you how should exciting. go. Exciting. <laughs> compile your .NET assemblies with GCC. Actually, like here's said, something I'm excited concept, about. But, yes. Visual Studio 2017. Mm -hmm. Is that uh, I also don't announced? It, announced and with an event too. Yeah. This one's a webcast, so oh. you don't have to go to it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So um, Visual Studio 2017 is going to launch on March 7th, Microsoft said. And there's going to be a two-day webcast. The first day is going to be the usual keynotes with the usual suspects talking about the product. Second day is a whole day of free training um, that right. you can sign up right. for, which is pretty cool. And I believe Scott Hanselman is, in fact, associated with this event. He is. He is. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Right, they're going to talk um, about Visual Studio, ASP.NET, the .NET Core, .NET Standard, um, all those all those fun topics. <laughs> good, 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 yeah. good. And that day, um, the same day, March seventh, is a day that the code actually becomes generally available. So it's not one of those right. launches where they launch it and then a month goes by and then you get the product. It's going to be that day. They're saying. Yeah, it seems like this should be getting. I mean, it almost seems like it could be ready now. I'm I'm surprised right. they even need that much time. Yeah. Probably RTM very soon, right? Good. Yeah, I would think so. That's exciting. That I'm excited about. Yeah. Um, why don't we take a... I'm just trying to gauge this. I think it's be a good time to take a little bit of a break and then uh, come back. Okay. If you want. Okay. I have questions. Well, yesterday was Patch Tuesday, but what happened? Was it, though? But was it? Right. I was waiting. You know, I just sit there waiting all day. <laughs> just waiting. This refreshing Windows update. Refreshing over and over again. But nothing. Our show today brought to you by my favorite little robot. Say hello to Curry, a real live robot pal. That I met for the first time uh, just a few weeks ago down at the Mayfield Robotics headquarters yeah, next to the Lexus dealership in Silicon Valley. <laughs> it's actually really cool. They have all sorts of cool toys in there. There's the, the, the size of it. Curry is about knee high to an eight-year-old. And they did that very in, in purposely. The idea is not to uh, scare or intimidate, but this is the first robot in your house. Your kids will love it. You will love it. Uh, Curry does it. And, and also not to scare you. It's very humanoid. It has, um, looks like, you know what it looks like? Rosie from the Jetsons. And it blinks and it bloops. It doesn't talk. Now, it can it can read to you. It can do podcasts. It can play music. It has very good speakers in its space. But it doesn't talk as Curry the robot. And that's intentional. It just bloops and bleeps. And the reason is they don't want it to be scary. Or intimidating. It's a think of it as a companion robot. Curry moves around, uh, avoids obstacles. In fact, as Curry moves around your home, it makes a map internally of your home, and then you can name things: kitchen, living room. It will not go up or down stairs, but it does have tractor treads, so it will easily go over door jams and little obstacles. Now it makes the map. But what's cool is it also has cameras, of course, and it can see. If there's an obstacle, so it will move around it automatically. 
it, even if it's not in the base map. When he or she is low on battery, she, she goes back to her dock. She can run for a few hours uh, on a charge. And kids, you know, and I, I have to say, I loved her. Curry has this great idle mode where, she, you know, she'll wander around a little bit. She can patrol, but she'll also, she might also join a conversation and just stand there and look back and forth at the speakers. It's, it's really kind of interesting. You can command Curry, of course. When, when you speak to Curry, hey, Curry, she'll look at you, she'll blink, and you can say things, I want to listen to podcasts. You can say, go check out the dog. In fact, you can do this over the Internet. Get Because Curry has a camera that we'll, we'll put out over the Internet, and she can tell you uh, if the dog's on the couch. If she hears a loud noise, Curry will go investigate and send you pictures. These are the sounds Curry makes. That's yes. That's no. And it, she can also t shake her head and nod. And She greets you differently every time you come home. She actually comes to the door and welcomes you. You can have her read to the kids at night as they go to bed. Face recognition so she can distinguish between you and your other family members and even your pets. She can, uh, and Curry is just so cute. This is the robot your kids will say, yeah, I remember in 2017, we got our first robot. I'll never forget Curry. Gosh, I kind of I kind of miss Curry. I grew up with Curry, that kind of thing. You might want some Curry, too. Curry's just a presence in your house, just a benign, sweet presence in your house. I'll tell you how I'm going to use it. Curry could come wake me up in the morning, set the alarm, come wake me up in the morning, start playing my favorite podcast, and then I could say, follow me. And as I go and make breakfast and brush my teeth, Curry will follow me around, continuing to play my shows. You can actually pre-order Curry right now on the website. It's H-E-Y, hey Curry, H-E-Y-K-U-R-I dot com. H-E-Y-K-U-R-I dot com. Be out later this year. Ref not A refundable deposit of $100 gets you in line. And if you decide to buy it at the time of shipment, it's $5.99 plus taxes and uh, shipping. Curry is very sophisticated. There's a lot going on in Curry that is kind of cool, kind of neat. I want you to check it out. Hey Curry, H E Y K U R I dot com. You can even pat her on the head or him. He has a heart light, the RGB heart light that can. Re Actually, when you go there, check out Curry's uh, team because some of the smartest roboticists in the world are working on Curry. K U R I. It's heycurry.com if you'd like to check it out or. Put down a deposit for your first companion robot. Curry's waiting for you. Paul Therott, Mary Jo Foley, we're talking Windows. And next on the agenda, what the hell happened to my patches? Actually, we talked a little bit about this um, yesterday on Security Now, because, of course, we talk about security patches. And Steve is theorizing, and it has to do with the SMB zero day that they discovered late in the cycle. Your thoughts? Mm. Maybe a showstopper? I mean, clearly it was a showstopper of some kind. So mm. Microsoft won't say what happened. Um, all is they're this saying, unprecedented, though? Have they ever done this it on is, the day of Patch Tuesday? Really? I believe it is wow. unprecedented. Yeah, they've, skipped, so, so. they've skipped Patch Tuesdays before, haven't they? Well, maybe not. Maybe a long time ago. But I, I, I don't recall a time when a Patch Tuesday occurred. And on that day, they, they said, said, yeah, yeah we're not, not going to do it. Right. So By the that, way, no, that could no lend, patches. <laughs> that could lend to your their, their, your idea there. Yeah. Um. So all they said on their post was, we discovered a last minute issue that could impact some customers and was not resolved in time for our planned updates. Sure. They won't say anything beyond that. I, I asked around to a few people yesterday and I had people telling me they thought it was the Microsoft build system that had a problem that it wasn't. Oh, could um, be that easily, right? Yeah. Right. Uh, but maybe here's, maybe they here's inadvertently the next day. fixed Windows 7 <laughs> patching. Yeah. Oh, right. Because that was supposed to happen yesterday too, right? Which is Microsoft right. was supposed to start doing some of those cumulative updates for Windows 7 and 8.1, the new um, roll-ups. That was supposed to take effect yesterday too. So maybe it was something with that. Mm. Um, we don't know. But here's here. We're, now we're on the next day, and it, we're past the time when the patches usually hit, if they're going to hit, and it's still not out. And there's no update to that post from yesterday. So, yeah. 
We don't know. We so, don't know when it's delayed. So this till. one is fairly important because there is this SMB. You right. have a malformed SMB block that will give an attacker uh, root uh, an exploitable code on your system. And um, right. it was yeah. the the, uh, dis the security firm that discovered it um, had told Microsoft about it three months ago. And then on February 5th, released the exploit in the wild. So it went, uh, two weeks ago, it was available. Mm -hmm. uh, Window at win10.py, Laurent Gaffey. Um, and mm -hmm. so the thought was Microsoft would be patching it yesterday. Yeah. Mm. Which gives it some urgency, frankly. Right. Yep. But maybe yeah, it could it could easily be could be could be as could be a showstopper they found in the fix, right? Something bad happened. Could be yep. the build system. Yep. You know, Donna Sakar came in one morning and just uh, <laughs> it had gone, you know, it stopped working. <laughs> uh, who knows? Plug. Yeah, pulled the plug. <laughs> she said, you know, hmm. Who knows? Since they're not saying, who knows? We I know. We don't really know. But I we do think know. with this zero day that it, there's some urgency yeah. that they get it out. I know. You would think, right? But we don't even know when it's delayed until. Like, they, they just said right. it's delayed. I, I think you also want to avoid uh, two days in one week where you issue a bunch of these kinds of patches, right? This is a schedule right. that right. IT pros rely on and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, it would probably be more disruptive to release a bunch of stuff and then the fix thing, if that's what it is. Um, but yeah, we can only just wait and wonder, and we'll see how much mm -hmm. information they supply. They're usually so transparent. I'm sure uh, we'll find out exactly what happens. You're being sarcastic, I can <laughs> tell. <laughs> okay. right. uh, I tried to say that. It was funny, though. I, I don't know if Paul was getting this. Like yesterday when this happened, people were like privately DMing me and then saying on Twitter to me, I didn't get my patches I, you yeah. know, I'm worried. Right. I'm like, no, no one got them. Nobody yeah. got You're them. You're not alone, my friend. <laughs> See, I would have kept those people busy. I would have been like, what ring are you in? <laughs> oh, You're so mean. <laughs> so mean. Nice. Well, I don't know. Mm. I don't know. You should have. Is this Patch yeah. Tuesday? I think it is. You know, maybe. It was weird. <laughs> yeah. I didn't realize yeah. it was unpre unprecedented. That's interesting. I think it is. Me too. I think so. Uh, and then I, uh, I'm i trying to decide, and maybe you can help me f decide. Uh, I guess Microsoft announced that I can buy Outlook Premium now. And it's, uh, is it, what is it? <laughs> what, what is it? It's not just All removing, right. it's not just removing ads. I mean, that's one of the benefits, but it's more than that, right? right? Yeah. In fact, it's interesting. I, I wonder if this doesn't take the place of that ad-free Outlook, whatever they were calling it. Um, Basically, it's a version of Outlook.com uh, where you get five email addresses off of a custom domain, which you can buy through Microsoft or go through a third party, you know, if you already own a domain. Microsoft used to offer this feature through Windows Live. Remember, they had Windows Live custom domains. Right. And I actually just set this up today to see if it was just the same thing all over again. But actually, intriguingly, it's actually a little bit different. So if you've ever added a custom domain to an Office 365 commercial account or to G Suite through, you know, the Google tools. You know, you have your throt.com and you have Paul at throt.com. You have your email addresses and all that stuff. And each of those things is a, is an account. It's its own account. And the Microsoft one, the I'm sorry, I should say the Outlook.com premium is a, a consumer offering. So it's actually, it's subtly different, but it's a very important difference because you don't create your first account with this custom domain. You actually sign into the service with your existing Microsoft account. So Therat at hotmail.com or whatever. Uh, that is what that first account you create is associated with. It's an alias. So if I, um, uh, you know, Paul's custom domain.com, whatever, at, you know, bought office, or I'm sorry, Outlook Premium, that account, Paul at Paul's custom domain.com, is actually the same account as my Microsoft account. It's oh, the same exact account. Nice. It's actually shared. So you could log into Windows Store, you could log into Xbox, whatever, with either account. It's the same account. So if you have services associated with your Microsoft account, if you have apps and games you bought on whatever platform, if you have movies and TV shows and music and whatever, it, it doesn't matter which one you sign in with. Um, people who have done email forwarding in the past or use, I guess, even alias, well, not aliases, but let's say email forwarding, know that um, Outlook.com or Hotmail back in the day had kind of a problem with that where you could uh, send an email as a different account and it would say on behalf of, you know, in the, in the, um, 
you know, in the, the code behind the email, which was kind of goofy. And I looked at this today and it's not like that. It's, it's just a normal outlook.com alias. So if I send an account from Paul at, you know, Paul's custom domain.com, it comes from that account. That's what it looks like. It email goes and, you know, comes and goes to that account. So it's, um, it's a little interesting if you're not, if you're used to how custom domains work at other services, including Microsoft's right on the co commercial side, this is different. It's, it's a little different. Um, if you invite other people, if I invite Mary Jo or my wife or somebody to be part of Paul's custom domain.com, uh, they will have to sign in with their Microsoft account first. There's no such thing as a custom domain as its own Microsoft account. It's always associated with another Microsoft account. Um, and I guess the theory there is if you were to stop paying Microsoft for the account, which you can do, right? Obviously, you could have a one-year subscription and give it up. You'll, you won't lose anything because if you bought Office 365 that year or you bought some game on the Windows Store, you bought music from Groove or whatever, it will always be associated with the underlying Microsoft account. You'll never lose it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of an important I, – I think that's the rationale behind it. Um, but that is how it works. And the reason I have to say I think is because they never announced it. They just yeah. – what <laughs> one day it was just available. <laughs> so, so that was the yeah. weirdest part of yeah. this whole thing. Right. Yep. Like it, yep. we knew this was in private preview since last mm -hmm. year. Um, then it went to public preview, which they also didn't announce last fall. And then suddenly right. the preview tag is gone. And I asked them, you know, so, hey, when did this Go become on. a finalized service? And they said, we have no comment. What? <laughs> it's <laughs> it's <odd>. so popular. <laughs> it markets itself, Mary Jo. I don't even know why you had to ask. Um, yeah, and also uh, U.S. Yeah. only still. Right. Um Although yeah. I think that's, that's, I think if you're in another country, I saw some people saying they logged in. Um, yep. So, so I, I, yeah. I, I also heard from those people. So I've, I've also heard from people that weren't able to make it work. So I think there's something goofy with Microsoft accounts where depending on when you created it, they didn't used to have country specific accounts and stuff. And it's oh, or, right. or that's right. back in the day, maybe someone logged into the U S site and got an account and they, you know, I don't, I, it's hard to say exactly it is supposed to be U.S. only. Mm. Um, I don't think I have this as a – let me look at my tips here today. Yeah. So the one thing you should know too is if you have any interest in doing this, uh, do it right now because now through the end of March, this costs $20 per year. Uh, after, if, you sign, if you sign up for it after that, it's going to cost $50 a year. Um, $20 a year is amazing and it, it, it appears to be perpetual. Oh, so you get uh, to – oh, it's not just this first year. Yeah, the language oh. that they use says you will re, uh, like you know, you'll get it again for twenty dollars a year next year. Um, the other thing to know is if you do register a domain through Microsoft as part of the wizard when you set up the account, uh, it's probably a lot simpler. I actually went with a domain I already owned, so it was one of those grueling things. We enter MX records and stuff at your registrar. It took about thirty minutes. I'm not, I'm just not very good at that kind of thing. But um, I assume it's going to be easier because mm -hmm. you know Microsoft will do it for you. Um, it will cost $10 a year extra for that. But $10 a year is about average for a domain name, right? If you went to Namecheap or something and bought a domain right now, typically it would be, you know, a .com or .net or whatever would probably be about $9.99. So that's not a bad rate. So you can get locked in for $20 or $30 depending on how you're going to do it. Um, you know, if you have any, <laughs> if you want to get your family, you know, like throtfamily.com or, you know, some kind of family domain or whatever it might be, um, this isn't a bad deal. Yeah, I might do it just, just to own it. And you get a, you get a shared OneDrive too. I haven't looked into this yet, but the Microsoft account I'm using has an associated Office 365 home account. So I have what, well, I have 10 terabytes, but I really have one terabyte, uh, you know, once that grandfathering thing ends, um, of storage associated with Office 365. The shared OneDrive account, I don't know if that's another terabyte or if it's just like a, you know, what is whatever OneDrive is at today, mm. 7 or 15 or whatever. Um, I do not know, but I, I should mm. try to figure that yeah. one out. I looked at it on the web, but I couldn't figure mm. it out. Because when you use um, Office 365 Home, you don't you get a separate OneDrive for each person who's you do, yeah. part of it? Yeah, right. yeah so... Uh, it's weird because you can mix and match this. Like I could literally offer you an account on this domain yeah. and it wouldn't cost me anything, right? Because you can put five people on it. Um, but let's say you would use it like a normal family. So maybe it's like 
me, my wife, and my two kids, and we all we share Office 365 homes. So that's $99 a year. And as part of that $99 a year, each of those accounts, each of those people gets their own one terabyte of OneDrive storage, right? Mm-hmm. So now I sign up for a domain and I and everyone in my family attach, you know, changes their account over to this new domain. They can still use their old account, but that, you know, they're going to use the new domain. In addition to that one terabyte, we all get access to a shared OneDrive. The idea being that Microsoft has set up a sharing for us and that we mm-hmm. all we can put stuff in there that all of us can access. Oh, right. Mm-hmm. And I just don't know how big that one is. Um, I'm going to guess. In, well, I shouldn't guess. I don't know. I can't, I can't tell. Uh, I haven't been able to see mm-hmm. it yet. But yeah. there is a shared one drive of some, of some capacity, <laughs> whatever it might be. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I might, you know, for 20 bucks, if it were perpetual, yeah. that's, that's cheaper like. than most that's the mail forwarding too. services. Yeah, I mean, something like Google, like G Suite is, uh, I think it's $60 per user per year, right? This is $20 for five users yeah. uh, for a custom domain. Oh, man, I mean, you I'm know, going to do it, that, it's, actually. Yeah, it's it's a good deal. And um, so I can use it. So you, and you, you did it the MX record way. So for instance, right now I'm paying, I think I pay Hover for email mm-hmm. service at leoville.com. And all it is is a forwarder. Yeah, so um, if you want to I could to do it that, that way, right? Address, right. Well, remember, though, it's only up to five accounts total. That's yeah. the one thing. You can't go. Well, and I think that's what I do because I have a, every okay. family. So if you know you're never going to go above that, this is yeah. an incredible deal. The email is is uh, is Outlook.com, which is really Exchange, which means that you can. Oh, so now you have an Exchange server. Essentially, it's a, it's a consumer service, but it, it's an Exchange. But you, you it, set it, it up is, as Exchange, not IMAP or POP. You set up as it's not IMAP or POP exactly. So oh. sometimes they'll have an Outlook.com specific thing but you can all yes you could set it up as exchange yeah interesting and it's going to be the store because actually i do want to you know i'm not i might not because all i'm doing now is forwarding gmail but so this would be if i were going to replace my mm-hmm. hover forwarding and my gmail account because i would use outlook but if you wanted right. to use an exchange server this would be a good way to do it if you so had I no more than five accounts what yeah, happens I'm if i sh- exceed five accounts do i pay per seat no, you can't. You just can't do you it. You just can't. It's, it's it's designed to be a you know it's a consumer service. If you need more than that, you have to go to business. But the problem is on the Office three sixty five business side, which I also do by the way, um, you know, with a custom domain, uh, the 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 prices vary, but they don't go down very far. I mean, the one that I do, I believe, is either a hundred or maybe a hundred and twenty dollars a year, but it's per user, right? So I only have one user on that account. It would be incredibly expensive to have five users. On Office 365, I think it's called Business Premium or whatever. Right, right. Um, it's yeah, worth it to me to have seat. one. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, you pay per seat, exactly. Yeah. So this is actually, so if so, uh, here's a use case. You mm-hmm. want to have a family email uh, system. Yeah, exactly. And, exactly. you know, you've got four kids or three kids and a wife and a husband. That's five people. Each of them can have a dedicated address at therot.com or whatever it is. Yep. And, and have enough for one of the cats. And one left over, <laughs> and uh, yep. and then they could go to Outlook.com with that address, which would then be tied to their at Microsoft account at some point, That's right? That's right. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yep. So their new yep. Microsoft account could could be Stephanie at Therot.com, yep. and yep. Yep. could she? And so, and because it's Exchange, she could use any client That's right. on on mobile or desktop to fetch the mail from Outlook.com. Yeah, although, I, by the way, I will say, as of today, now this is a known issue. If you go to Outlook Mobile on iOS, at least, and probably on Android, too, you can sign in with this new account, right, Paul at Paul's Custom Demand.com, whatever it is. Right. Uh, you use the same password that you use on your Microsoft account. If you have two-step authentication, you do this, you use the same Microsoft Authenticator app or whatever Authenticator app, however you do it, to get through the security. Uh, but on the mobile app, it's it's weird because the aliases all show up in a list because you know you want to be, um, you have this notion of default account right and so if you're using a custom domain you probably want that to be the account but you also want to be able to hit the from button and have a list come down of all the possible aliases that are available because in addition to your custom domain and your main Microsoft account you might have you can and you might have created other aliases within Outlook.com's you know web interface right. Um, you know, for mailing lists or, you know, whatever. Um, there's a bug in the mobile app today in Outlook Mobile where 
each of those entries, even though they are different account names or email addresses, I guess, they all appear as your Microsoft account email address, so you can't tell which one is which. Um, they're going to fix that, but that's just a temporary bug uh, in the mobile app. But you could use, um, I think you can sign into Exchange with Gmail on mobile. You could use um, whatever whatever apps are compatible with Exchange would work, yeah. yeah. This is, uh, I think this is a good deal. If you wanted an Exchange, I mean, look, you couldn't do a hosted Exchange server for that little no, $20 not even a close. year. Yeah. Yep. I mean, you don't get you don't get like lots of business. You don't get any of the business stuff, right? Like with Office three sixty five commercial accounts, you're getting you know SharePoint and and right. Skype for Business and all you know whatever Skype. You can get Skype minutes and stuff. But uh, this is really just I, this is really kind of an interesting thing, and it's something that's been missing for a while. The, what you want is custom domains. That's it. It's custom domains. And you and, don't have uh, to buy the domain from Microsoft, which is ten dollars no. a year. You could, if you have a domain. Uh, yeah, just, which is what I did. You, yep, you changed the DNS records for the domain to point to Microsoft to Outlook.com. Yeah, it's it's. A, I mean, I will say you can do it. I know you're going to be able to handle it. But um, yeah. Well, uh, and people yeah. listening, listening, to, people, anyone listening to this podcast, will have no if problem. you've never uh, changed a DNS record, <laughs> oof, oof. And it's the just, thing is, like, you, it's not that you hard. To, but. Well, no, but but it's brutal because you Google it. The problem is Microsoft says. Here's the name. Here's the ID. Here's the address. But and then the the even the field names are completely different in right. the in the registrar's site. And so it's, it's probably more than just an IP address. You probably also have some text fields and authenticating fields and things. Yeah, like you that. have it's you have a C name, a text, and an MX record. Yeah. you have to change. Yeah. And it's um, it is a lengthy process. I took a screenshot of every single step of this. Oh, good. Um, this is on your site. I didn't. I didn't publish oh, it because okay. it was so awful. I was like, no one's going to look at this. I, 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 <laughs> well, I, there's those of us who've done it. I mean, I've done it many times. I have many. You yeah. Know, I but think, right. So I've done this before for different. I've done it for Gmail. I've done it for uh, Office 365 commercial. It's it's never fun for me. I'm yeah. not very good at it. But I think people, like I said, technical people probably you know they'll be okay. Nor the the problem I guess is normal people. What they'll want to do is buy it through Microsoft. Right. Because right. Then I think I haven't it. tried it, yeah. but there's no way you know. They're going to configure all that stuff for you. So you just type in the domain you want. They tell you if it's available. If it is, you can get it, and you're done. And I think that's how it's going to work, and that will be great for normal people. Um, you know, my I also hard. use uh, Fastmail, which is a um, commercial IMAP provider. That's actually my main mm -hmm. email provider. And they will also do hosted custom domain names. I don't even know what the limit is as part of your deal. But you're paying for really an email service, and it is definitely more than twenty dollars a year. It's an IMAP email service. So, yeah, I mean, by the way, so this is there a limit on the amount of mail you can store there on Outlook? No, um, it's effectively unlimited. They won't say it like that, but it's you know the no, it's it's effective. I think it's a, it is either effectively or literally okay. unlimited. And do the other features of the Exchange server, like context and calendar, work or no? Yeah, but so yes, um, yes. So you well, do get a pretty all that good stuff. deal. Yeah, it's whatever you get. I'm going to do it just because I want to have it, and maybe I'll use it. Maybe I won't. But twenty, yeah. but you know. So have you switched over to the new Outlook.com? Do you even use Outlook.com? I have. Or do you it have is switched over now. You'd have so to. If you look at your you have to be switched over to the Outlook.com. <laughs> yeah, there's there's all kinds of crazy little caveats <laughs> to this service. Unfortunately, um, but there I are am. people. You who see the black bar? That means I'm now. One of yes. you, yeah. So if you look at, if you click on that blue thing up in the corner, the little grid, you can see like people, which is contacts, uh, calendar, tasks. Oh, this is all part of it anyway. It's all part of it. And so okay. this will but all is be it associated. in the Exchange server as well now? I mean, in other words, if I use Outlook Desktop, would my yeah. calendar, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Yep. That's a good, that's nice. I think that's a good feature. Yeah. It does get rid of ads too, you know, so yeah. you can get rid of the ads. Um, yeah. Well, I'm using an ad blocker, so yeah, they're yeah, not happy too. about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, well, but you're you're wasting a little bit of space over there, right? Yeah, because yeah, it's it's say you're bar. using an ad blocker. So, and it does give me a link. Say, go here for ad free Outlook. Is this the same thing? No, but by the way, it's the same price, <laughs> and oh, you get so that's much confusing. more. Yeah, right. Not, yeah, so I don't do this. No. Okay, and and Paul does have an article on his site at therot.com on how to sign yeah. up for the new 1995 Outlook. And th as as far as anybody can tell, it says it's gonna. It says we'll renew at 1995. Yeah, it a year. literally says that. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, you know, I don't know how long, but even if you get a couple of years at 20 bucks, it's crazy. That's such a crazy price. Yeah, I like it. Maybe that's why they didn't want to, you know, um, 
make a big deal out of the fact Too that late. it was available. We just did. Well, sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know. Right. Because normally it's forty nine ninety five, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Which, by it, the way, is, is still incredibly reasonable for five accounts. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, like like I said, like a Google Apps or G Suite account, it's uh, six, I believe it's sixty or it's fifty or sixty dollars per user per year. You know, mm -hmm. getting five accounts for fifty dollars, it's like that's you know, for and family. You know, that's very reasonable. If you use this, you're going to have like lots of friends come over and give you a cake. <laughs> apparently, <laughs> right, according so, to Paul's website. Allow me to break through the mystery of how I choose the images for these articles. <laughs> Randomly, would that be? No, that's what people think. But this <laughs> image is from an Outlook.com promo video oh. uh, of Microsoft. So I usually I try to choose one for that they you know nice. an image from a video they used. That's pretty funny. Premium all Outlook. the that's young funny. people. Yeah. <laughs> so this is this is where I should go. This is the article to uh, to tell me how to do this. Yeah, this is the one where I actually used it and explained like how this works. Okay, it's basically yeah. the discussion we just had yep. Yep. written down. In fact, I was just reading from it. I hope that's not a problem. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, I'm going to do this yeah, right now. I, yeah. I'm just curious about this one, this um, shared space thing. I don't quite. Mm. Well, that could be so. It could be tied yeah. to your OneDrive capacity then in some way. That's what Google does with Gmail, right? Yeah, but it seems it seems like they should. Did they should say something. anything in the FAQ? There was an FAQ for this whole thing. Yeah, too. I might have just not seen it. I'm not really sure. Yeah, the the the, the dashboard uh, for this is extremely minimal. It's actually almost comic. Um, there is really nothing to. <laughs> this is not much to manage. You know, it's very mm -hmm. it's very basic. Um, hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I, I'll I'll keep looking at it. Well, thank you for the write-up, though. That's this is helpful, and I do think this seems like a very good deal. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. I guess I should stop signing up and pay attention to the show now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, do you want to talk about uh, the Outlook calendars working now with your Echo? And notice yeah. I say Echo, not <laughs> that other word. That other word. Yeah, we have a new we have a new policy here on the Twit Podcasts. To avoid, when possible, uh, trigger words. Mm. I think we're going to have to start doing trigger word alerts. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You could bleep right. us out we, if we. We do actually. And some of the and then some of the shows we actually have a bleep <laughs> for that. Because we well, you know what happened, and actually it's kind of embarrassing. Uh, apparently, I bought uh, a number of echoes uh, by accident on people who are listening because I walked through oh, no. the echo purchase process. Oh, or something. That's Actually, amazing. Somebody wrote an email to the new screensaver saying, hey, knock it off, you bought me an Echo. And so mm -hmm. I said, oh, I don't think that's possible. <laughs> because in order to do that, I would have to say, and then I would have to say yes at exactly the right time. And right. unless you haven't turned on the pin, I guess some people have not turned on the pin. Anyway, I mm -hmm. walked through it and apparently bought more Echoes. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. So, wow. So I apologize uh, if I bought anybody an Echo, <laughs> but you're going to love it. <laughs> Another yeah. Echo, because they had to have to have a first one in the first place. Um, wow. Yeah. Wow. Anyway, don't say what this is, but say the Echo word. This is tricky. Okay. So up until recently, you could easily connect your Google Calendar to your Echo. Yeah. But now you can connect your Outlook.com or Office 365 Outlook or Hotmail, too, I think, to Echo, which is great for all the people yep. who use Microsoft products with their Echo. I'm making sure I'm not saying the word Echoes. Echo. Echoes, okay. <laughs> Echoes, okay. And uh, you would go and see, now here's the problem. The name of the app is the A word. So right. we're going to say, go into your Echo app. Alicia. Yes. Alicia. Alicia, that's <laughs> hey, good. Hey, Alicia. I know some. I know some people named the A word, so. and it's a real yep. problem. Yeah. Um, anyway, so go into the app. I presume I'm making this up as I go along, but I presume if you go into the app, you can turn on. Or do you have to do that? You have to turn on the Outlook calendar, right? Probably have to. Is it a task? It looks like you go in, a select task? the calendar. Oh, you okay? You can log in. Okay, good. Yeah. Good. And um, good, yeah. Good. So that's nice. Nice. Can't do that with the other 
because there are no um, echo equivalents with Cortana yet, right? So one day <laughs> when somebody makes one of those, yep, you'll be able to do that too. We'll all but. be using these Amazon things, whatever they're called. <laughs> that They'll point. be everywhere. They'll be yeah. everywhere. Now, okay, um, do I have to choose a personalized email address to sign up for this? <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> ah. Yes, you do. You either have to own one already or be willing to choose one during the process. I see. Oh, I see. A little down below. Use my own domain name. Yeah, you like what, if you were to sign up for an Office 365 commercial account, by default, what you get is a, a, a something dot on Microsoft account. Right. And then you can add domains to it you could add multiple domains in fact and then you could also get rid of that on microsoft account which you should um but the point of that is you don't actually have to ha be ready with the custom domain at sign up which you know makes sense for a business or whatever but yeah if you're an, in an individual or family doing this uh, you, yeah you need to be ready to roll uh with a new domain yeah i have to think about this because i don't know if i want laportefamily.net <laughs> yeah which by the way they so they, they suggested that by default didn't they yeah that's yeah. the default. So, because they, for me, it was like the Rot family, right? right? Because they're trying to. It's a family Kind thing. of emphasize. It's yeah, a family the, the affair. It's a family affair. All right. Let's uh, take a break. And then Windows 10 news. We're going to the cloud and Microsoft Xbox One news featuring mm -hmm. Paul Therat. <laughs> <laughs> and a snoozing Mary Jo Foley. Ooh. <laughs> I just have I have an extra Xbox item too to add. I'm so sorry. Oh, I love them. Keep them. Coming. I just added one for you. Oh, Mary Jo, see, oh, you're an enabler. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. she's an enabler. I care. Invited. Yeah, I, I was care. just invited to this. I think I'm going to go to this, but we'll get okay. to that. Oh yeah. man, what a tease, Mary Jo. Yeah. I'd like you to. Yes. Come with me. You want me to go? No. <laughs> Would you be my date at the Xbox event? You, come on. Not come going. on. Come on. <laughs> Uh, somebody's telling me that Microsoft is, I can't believe this, using GoDaddy they as have the registrar, yeah. GoDaddy. which yeah, means, GoDaddy. and this is not good news, that because uh, GoDaddy makes you pay extra for who is privacy. Oh, okay. So yeah. be aware of that. You may want to actually get a domain somewhere where they have who is privacy, like our sponsor, Hover.com, and then, sure, uh, which would be the same price, and then uh, and use that one. But you'll have to mess with that MX record. Yep. 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 Listen, grab a bottle of wine and just plan on spending a good hour doing it. <laughs> what, a lot of fun. What fun. You'd be one Googling fun. a lot. You know, if you were to apply for a home loan at Rocket Mortgage at the same time as you started this MX record, you'd be getting the loan faster than you'd be getting the domain name all set up. That's what I love about Rocket Mortgage. It's brand new, a brand new product from Quicken Loans. Quicken Loans, the number one mortgage lender. I mean, the best mortgage lender in the country. And just look at their JD Power Customer Satisfaction Awards, and you'll see that that's you know year after year been true, uh, both as a loan originator and for servicing. So you know it's a great experience. But they've made it even better for people like us, the geeks who want to do it all online. And you don't have to mess with DNS. <laughs> you just go right now to quickenloans.com slash windows. And within minutes, you can get approved for a custom mortgage solution tailored for your financial situation. You can submit all the paperwork on your phone with a touch of a finger so that this all is a smooth, friction-free process. You can customize the rate, the, the term, all of that very easily and get that approval so fast that you could do it at an open house and hold up the phone and say, see, we're pre-approved. Refinances too, and now's a good time. Interest rates, it's pretty clear. I'm I'm just, you know, looking at what Janet Yellen said yesterday. And are they're gonna be going up. They're gonna be going up. So now's the time if you're gonna refi to lock in the current interest rates. Skip the bank, skip the waiting, and do it completely online. Because you're a geek. We know that. Go to quickenloans.com slash windows for Rocket Mortgage Equal Housing Lender. Licensed in all 50 states. NMLSconsumeraccess.org number 3030. Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Quickenloans.com slash windows. Paul Therott and Mary Jo Foley, they're talking windows. And Windows 10. Uh, what's the news Project Neon. You do the first one because that? I don't care about this 
at all. Wow. <laughs> wow. Mary Jo. No hoodie yeah, been there? <laughs> yeah, no. I, no okay. Well, uh, last week, Microsoft held a, what appeared to be an impromptu developer event <laughs> online. Um, <laughs> they didn't really warn anybody it was coming, to my knowledge. But they had Come a win, kind of a win. <laughs> well, so, you know, I would have. I would have paid more attention to it if I had known it was happening. Anyway, um, as part of that, they actually teased something that has been rumored for some time now that with the next version of Windows, not the one that's coming out this uh, March or April, but the one that's coming out in the fall, RS3 or Redstone 3, will feature a new user interface for the first time in a long time, actually. I mean, Windows 10 today is basically just a minor evolution of what they first introduced in Windows 8. And so they're finally giving it kind of a, a spit shine or whatever. And it's mm -hmm. currently called Project Neon, but they showed off a, like a prototype or whatever screenshot kind of thing uh, to give us an idea of what, it, what it's going to look like. And it's going to look like an Easter egg, <laughs> <laughs> basically, kind of a pastel-y looking thing. But, um, I, you know, I, I think, Mary Jo, you, you, I think when this was first rumored, if I remember correctly, you wrote something about the evolution of Microsoft's user experiences, right? So I did. you're, you're yeah. obviously not impressed by this. Right. So this is actually <laughs> the third. I know something yeah. about it, but you know, the reason I'm joking about it is whenever I see screenshots of this Project Neon, I'm like, okay, so what's different? I don't see, I don't notice yeah. anything different. You don't and see color, is what you're saying. I just, I see new <laughs> colors. Okay. But I'm like, is that like what everybody's yeah. talking about? Cause some people are like, no, it's the blurring. Like they used to have an arrow and I'm like, okay, is this something huge? I don't know. Like to me, I just don't notice design that much. So for me, yeah. this is just a non-starter. Like when they were showing screenshots of the leak design from the, um, from the event last week, I'm like, I don't even see what they're showing me. I don't see right. what's different. It looks the same as anything looks to me right now. Yeah, I, I so uh, the one unknown here is if they're going to consolidate what today are a bunch of different UIs. And so you right. can do some goofy stuff in Windows 10 right now where you put on the dark theme. Some of the apps don't convert to dark automatically. Yeah. You have to manually switch them over. And then there are UIs that can't switch over because they're legacy UIs like Windows Explorer and the control panel yeah. where most of your screen is all black or really dark. And then these these windows just pop up as these really bright white kind of areas. And right. so aside from the design, which is subjective, obviously, my, my hope with this thing is that they at least make it consistent across mm -hmm. all of the UIs that you can see in Windows. So right. we right. shall see. Yeah. That's all I have to say about Neon. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I'm like, okay, yeah, it's coming. Probably not till Redstone 3 is the common um, yeah. conjecture right like that's when people will first really start seeing it yep it's it's not going to be for this coming release that's no. for sure right yeah see you <laughs> great okay tell me about dynamic lock screen though like why okay. you think this is a gigantic mess <laughs> well okay depending on the platform um you can do things like by the proximity of a device, an Apple Watch, an iPhone, a Microsoft Band right. or whatever, uh, do things like automatically unlock the system or automatically lock it when you go away. Windows doesn't have any of this. <laughs> so um, starting with Redstone 2, which is coming out in a few weeks or a couple months or whatever, um, they are adding a feature called dynamic lock, which is half of that equation. It's the yeah. locking part of it, not the unlocking part of it. Okay. And the way it works is if you have a, a Bluetooth device that is paired to your PC and you bring it away from your PC, after 30 seconds, your PC will lock, which, you know, is fine. It sounds great, right? Like, what could you know, this is a great idea. So here's what's missing. You can't configure which device causes this. So you might have five uh, Bluetooth devices paired to your PC. If you walk away with one of them, will it lock? It's not clear, right? Mm. Why isn't there a list where you say, I want my iPhone to be the one, you know? Um, there's a bug in the current build where you can't actually uh, pair a Bluetooth device using the settings app, but you can get around that. That's not a big deal. Mm. The The other issue is the 30-second timeout. I mean, yeah. ideally, uh, in my house, I don't have a very big house, <laughs> but I can walk from here to the far end of the house downstairs, which is the kitchen, and Bluetooth is still connected, right? So mm. I can't 
disconnect. It won't disconnect. But let's it say that disconnect that's, when you get up, right? It has to yeah, be like right. 30 seconds after you're out of range. <laughs> Out of range. And Bluetooth range is not that big, right? It's like a personal area yeah. network. It's it's probably, I don't remember the it's exact number. It's 100 feet, but it, 30 meters. It's 100 feet. Well, actually, that's pretty big. That's bigger than Supposedly. I well, but, it, you know. It doesn't go through I mean, there walls. are things like walls and stuff that yeah. will, uh, you know, help to break the connection. I, I, I believe I triggered this by walking outside one time. The way I've been triggering it during testing is just to turn off Bluetooth on the device, right? Which is mm, kind of cheap. But right. It's kind of just a way to see if it's working. Um, what I would like is, uh, in addition to choosing which device, or I guess devices trigger this effect, how about um, a, a timer choice? Like, I want it to happen immediately, right? Because ideally, what really happens is you step up from your computer and you walk away, and Windows Hello notices that you're not there anymore, and it just logs you out. Like, that would be a way more secure mm. mm -hmm. system than this. Like, this is, it's nice. I'm glad they're doing it. Um it needs some work. And, maybe, and by the way, it's not complete. This is a Windows Insider feature. It just debuted last week. You never know. They could be literally adding this stuff. But I talked to Raphael about this. And I'm hoping, like today maybe or tomorrow, sometime this week, he's going to publish an article. Because he actually dug into this and found out that you can, in fact, uh, impact which device triggers it and, and how long mm -hmm. the timeout is. So like, that stuff's available. It's just not in the UI. So um, I don't know if he's writing an app to make that happen or what he's doing exactly, but um, he he has looked into it and and this stuff is at least possible. Mm -hmm. So today it's a mess. Maybe it gets better. <laughs> You've used an Android's lock, right? Bluetooth unlock. Oh yeah, I know. In fact, right, and that so works I, pretty well. Yeah, but so you have you to have tell like, it it's a trusted device. Yeah. Yep. And it won't and you don't have to it doesn't always have to be. And it's not it's not completely automatic, which I like. So in other words, you open yes. your Chromebook and you you have your Android phone with you that is the device lock paired or whatever it's called, and you just click your picture and then you log in, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's good. Like that that's fine. I, I, I like that. I don't know about the lock part of it. I don't know if Android has uh or um Chrome OS it, has like an auto lock. lock. Let me think about yeah, that. I don't think so, but the, you know, yeah, well, no, it does. Because when it, but see, this is a difference between a mobile device and a desktop. Yeah. In a mobile device, when the screen goes off. No, no, I mean, I mean, if you walk away with your trusted device, like in other words, um, you know, you no, I understand, away, and so it, yeah. it's unlocked until the screen goes off. Yeah, and it locks. And it locks. So, but on mobile uh, devices, that's usually a minute or two. It's not very long. Everyone listening to this already knows this, but here's a little tip: <laughs> Windows key plus L. <laughs> Just. If you want your computer to lock when you walk away, yeah, win Windows key plus mm -hmm. L. Yeah, there. Where did I just see that they're adding automatic like a, locking? Auto lock. Yeah, it seems like the, these are one half of the full story. Both of these things, right? Like, right. If, if you do one half of it, it seems like you will be doing the other half, right? Because you can see the value of both. Um, it's odd to me that Microsoft started with. This feature, I think. Remember, Mary Jo, they talked. They were briefly going to use um, Microsoft Band for this purpose. Yeah, and by they the were. way, yep. it would still work because it works with any Bluetooth device. Right. So if you pair a Microsoft Band, you you could use it in this capacity. Um, but I thought is, I thought with the Band, weren't weren't they going to let you unlock or and or lock? Yeah, like you were yeah, able to do either yeah, one. Right? They've been talking about it, right? So it was kind of surprising when they added this feature because it just seemed like this wasn't going to make it. Yeah. And, and it, it's weird to me that the creator's update will almost certainly just ship with half of it. And if it ships the way it is now, it's not just half of it. It's like half of it poorly implemented, um, mm. which is goofy. And I hope they don't do that. Yeah. Don't forget, though, once they start rolling out creator's update, they'll be rolling out fixes constantly to it like they did with yeah. the other ones. So they'll have time but to fix it. I but it's a you know it, it's a UI feature in the settings app. Is that the type of yeah. thing that they change over right. time, or does that wait for the next version of Windows? Yeah, uh, good Windows question. 10? I don't know. I mean, I I, I wish they could. Or do they that. say sometime in the next couple of weeks? Oh yeah, so that was in testing with insiders, but it's actually not going to make it into the final. Yeah, I mean, they could do you that. only have to look at it for ten seconds to see the problem, <laughs> like you know, yeah. because you can't see what it. I mean, how does it know what you know? And I te I tested this to try to really figure it out. You know, I I connected my Fitbit to it and I connected my iPhone to it, and if I walk away with just one of them, will it trigger 
the locking and it I have to, I, I really can't say with certainty that I understand how it works right oh I that, that's not true it works poorly <laughs> <laughs> that's how I would say yeah. yeah so I just uh, the first step is to take your existing domain name and add a text record to it which I did <laughs> I knew you were working on that yeah you could tell huh <laughs> And that was yeah. pretty easy, but then I guess I'm going to have to add an MX record just to get yeah. the mail forwarding from it to it. There, I don't re uh, not off the top of my head. I don't remember, but you do some bit, little bit of domain registration stuff in the beginning. Then you yes, fill that's out the a, text. Credit card information. Yes, that's where I am and now. Then you, yeah. And then you do. Yeah, you got to do more of it. There's, yeah, the BMX stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've done it's, this before. It's a, a C name and a uh, an MX record yeah. you have to do yeah. and a text record. Wait a minute. Please make sure. Oh no. Okay. That you have not purchased this service yet in other countries or regions. No, I haven't. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry. It's funny. They ask you at one point. There's, there's a lot of. There's a wizard. There's like 200 steps. There's a lot of and, stuff. Yeah. Yeah. There's a but lot of stuff. At least they walk you through it. You know, it's not they bad. They walk you. Th yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there's a point though where they say uh, we need to verify that you actually own this domain, and I'm That's thinking this is interesting. Record. Yeah. 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 So yeah, what you happens. do is it's a it's kind of a dummy DM, DNS record, and then you could just then do a who is or a, a yeah, dig on the DNS yeah. and say, oh good, he controls this domain because he was able to add this text record to the domain. That means he controls it, that's and right. that's what they're trying to verify initially. You know, we you can't just set this up with somebody else. <laughs> I have so many domains. You know. Yeah. I was sharing some of my, uh, my domains with Mary Jo this morning. I have some really stupid domains. Oh, I have the worst. <laughs> I have, if anybody wants it, tunic time. Because <laughs> briefly we thought we were going to get in the tunic business. <laughs> That's awesome. I also have fancy pants, but, uh, you know. Fancy pants is an awesome domain That's name. That's good. <laughs> Maybe that should be my new that's... email, leo at fancypants.com. <laughs> no, that's a really good name. Oh, I have some fun ones. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have pocketpaul.com. Pocket Paul, I love it. I have Paul of Is that was that going to be Paul of Duty? Yep. Paul oh, Paul, you got Duty. some good ones. Oh man, that's oh, yeah. really good. I yeah, used to have crazy enough. Microsoft rumors, but I sold that one. Oh, that's good. It was a good one. Yeah. You sold it. I had some it? like Redmond and Microsoft. Oh, I sold it off. Names. I didn't want it. Yeah. 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 Pocket Paul. That's yep. pretty funny. That yeah. Paul is good. Pocket. That's a good name. Yep. Pocket Leo, is it too late? There's no alliteration though. You want the alliteration? <laughs> All right, I'll pause my uh, I'll pause my purchase to continue on. Sorry about that. Oh, that's good. Um, Cortana reminders go live. Yay! A year later, after this is Microsoft something promised out. before, huh? Yeah, like but you know they talked about ago. it a year ago, right? They said we're going to make it so um, if you if you agree and you send an email or receive an email that has a time commitment in it, like I'm going to finish this blog by the end of today, the Cortana will come up and say, do you want me to put a reminder in for you to ask you, did you finish the blog today? Right. Um, so they're starting to roll this out now. Um, it uses under the covers, Microsoft says it uses machine learning techniques that help, help uh, them. It uses take these Scruggle techniques. Scruggled. Yeah. Scruggled. Yes. You have to agree to this and you have to allow it. It's not just going to happen is my understanding, <laughs> which is good is. because if you, if they didn't have this as a permission-based thing, I think they would get in trouble. Um, starting to roll out in the U.S. on Windows 10, support for iOS and Android in the coming weeks. So don't, don't be alarmed if you don't have it yet. And um, it works with Outlook.com. Office 365 work and school email addresses. Other, they said other email uh, um, services will be supported soon also, but they yep. didn't say which email services. So I asked them that and Gmail will be included. They basically will, said huh? they want this to work broadly across all the popular Thanks. services. Okay. Yep. And so by yeah. the way, this Did works pretty well. Tried, been, did you try to get that? this to work and you couldn't? I, no, no, I, that, no, you're thinking of... Um, something else I, I this one i did get to work okay um this works like this actually works um and this this goes back to that conversation i had with ryan gavin back in january where you know where i said look you guys are getting killed by this amazon thing whose name should never be spoken um by you know siri on mobile or google assistant yeah. on mobile whatever you know when, when are you gonna kind of step it up and 
Mm-hmm. They're not. They appear to be not afraid, but they what they were talking about was obviously an emphasis on productivity. But more important, making this thing so important to everyone's everyday lives that you really miss it when it's not around, like an actual personal assistant. And we've all right. done this, and we've all had this done to us, where it's like right before the holidays, you're like, "Listen, I'm going to be away for a couple of days. I'll get back to you on this." And then you never follow up, not because you're a jerk and you lied, but because, you know, life is busy and you forgot and that's what happens. <laughs> or and you're a jerk and you lied. Let's leave that open too. Okay, we'll leave that <laughs> open as a possibility. Fair enough. Okay. Um, but the point is it will come, it will see that in your email, that kind of language. Mm-hmm. And that's where the machine learning comes in. Right. And then Cortana will prompt you and say, hey, you told Bob you were going to get back to him on this uh, report thing. Do you want to make a reminder about that? And because Cortana is on all your devices, it can work on, you know, your Windows 10 PC. Uh, and in the f- uh, it, it doesn't actually pop up automatically, but it will on Android, iOS, or Xbox, or wherever else Cortana is. If you do make a reminder on your Windows 10 PC, which you can do right now, that reminder shows up everywhere Cortana is, of course, because that's how reminders work in Cortana. So, it, it, <clears throat> you know... It, you can kind of talk about what you're trying to do with Cortana as Microsoft does. And you can talk about how you need it to be really essential and important and all that kind of stuff. But when you see something like this, you can yeah. see the, the, the reality of the, of the possibility of it, you know, that, mm-hmm. yeah, this is like, this is a real need. Like this is a good idea. Or you get really mad at Cortana cause she keeps bugging you about all the things yes. you don't do. Cortana <laughs> reminded me on Monday that, um, Valentine's day was coming up. That's so that was so sweet. Did she was want timely. like flowers? Did she want some? No, no. She wanted to see if I wanted to uh, buy flowers or book a restaurant to do something like that. Now, I think now, that's kind of cool. That's good. I do too. Uh, I think that should have come maybe two weeks earlier because I don't know if mm. you've been following how busy restaurants are on Valentine's Day, but <laughs> <laughs> the day before Valentine's is not the time to book that restaurant. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a good idea. That's a good example of, you know, I, my reaction is probably the same as Mary Jo's where um, I see those those types of pop ups and I react in a fairly visual, visual, you know, vis- hello, <laughs> visceral, visceral, vis- I don't know why I want to say visual, <laughs> a visual, a visual, a <laughs> in a Sean Connery kind of way. Um, <laughs> and I want what my first thought is, how, where do I go to turn this off? I know. Stop bugging me. <laughs> but the thing is, honestly, I mean, notifications exist for a reason and done mm-hmm. properly. Like that's, you know, it's a good idea. You know, I, I don't use Cortana that much, but I did when when you first could start setting reminders, I did try it once and I set it up to on my on my phone. I set it up to next time I'm at Fairway, remind me to buy milk. So I walk into Fairway and the reminder pops up and I'm like, oh, it worked. I was like so yeah, stunned, yeah. you know. <laughs> That's amazing. And that's great. Like it's using location cool. services. Yeah. It's a good yeah. example of why Cortana makes sense on a phone, right? It's not enough right. to right. have it on your PC. That, that's, yeah. yeah, that's great. Now the problem is when these things don't fire, <laughs> right? Yeah. If you, you're counting if you on grow them. to rely on this thing, <laughs> I know. Right. as you might, and then you walk into that store and it doesn't remind you, and then you get home and you're like, what the fuck? I, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, that, that could be aggravating. <laughs> Which, by the way, explains my entire relationship with technology. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've uh, set it all up now, and anytime anybody wants to send anything to, I probably should fancy give, pants. Yeah, yeah I mean, fancy <laughs> pants. Leo at fancypants. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Again, no, it was an amazing. It, thing. Yeah, it was. It was another it was two text records because there's also a reverse lookup record uh, for um, SPF, and then there is uh, then there's the C name. And there's yeah. an MX. Yeah, so you're right. It's quite a few things to do. You got to yeah. go. You got to go through it. Yeah. But what I really through. like, they walk you through it quite, mm-hmm. st- you know, standardly. Now, what what what's your domain registrar? Uh, Hover. So you probably do this enough that this didn't even throw you. But the, you the know, labels they're, they're, are different. Microsoft yes, calls it, it one thing, exactly. and Hover calls exactly. it another thing. See what what they should do is say which one are you using? Yeah. And then this use the right labels. This is how it's that called. That would that yeah. would have helped enormously. Yeah. You know? mm. Yeah. For me, I mean, I'm just, I'm just. No, no. I do if, this. So if you don't do it every day, yeah. If you don't do it every yeah. day, it's you do. Yeah. But when I've been through back, the label miss. You know, I've been through all of this before. So. Yeah. To me, it's always like yeah. the first time. Yeah. Have Cortana yeah. remind you. Yeah, yeah. What's the C name again? <laughs> yeah. 
And what is a uh, oh focused inbox? I like focused inbox. That's the thing where yeah. What? Now it, remember when this so this debuted in Accompli before Microsoft bought it. Right. In fact, I think I that's how a, I know. Accompli is kind of interesting because it's a lot like that um, giant anti spyware thing from back in the day, <laughs> where I I kind of came on to it at some point. Fell in love with it, recommended it, and then Microsoft bought it like immediately afterwards. Right. You know, coincidentally. <laughs> yeah. But um, so the big feature of the Accompli app, aside from the fact that it looked and worked like Outlook because it offered not just email but context calendar, storage services, and so forth, was this AWS-based service, by the way, that you had to pump your email through. So in other words, your email would go into whatever account you had, would shoot up to AWS, and it would come back down to the app. And the AWS, the service they had up in AWS, which was focused inbox, would divide your email into important and non-important. And so the important email would be like, you know, email from Mary Jo, email from Leo. Non-important email would be email from Brad. No, it would be, um, you know, <laughs> mailing lists or, you know, whatever. And you could make it work better over time by saying, no, this isn't important or yes, this is important. Mm -hmm. And you'd have like a focused view and a, a an other view or whatever. So Microsoft bought. Accompli turned it into Outlook Mobile, and of course, a lot of businesses were like, "We can't use this app because we can't send our email through a third-party service." Mm -hmm. And I believe, Mary Jo, you probably know this. I think it's based on Azure now, right? Isn't it off of Amazon? I think they did. And I think they got yeah. it off. Yeah. So you can federate um, your infrastructure to like a uh, Azure AD up in the cloud. It'll be safe and secure for businesses if you want to do that. I think that, I think that's how that works. But for individuals, it's you know whatever. It's straight Azure. And it's kind of a cool feature. Or <laughs> for the other 50% of the world who hates this, you can just turn it off. Anyway. Yay, um, that's me. <laughs> yeah, well, a lot of people don't like it, yeah. So for um, uh, for Outlook at Microsoft, which is, uh, you know, its products are legion, there's Outlook.com, there's Outlook on the web, there's Outlook 2016 on both Windows and Mac. There's the Mail app in Windows and on Windows 10 Mobile. Um, and then there's the Outlook Mobile app, which is on Android and iOS. Okay. So they're trying to make these things look and work more like each other. And over time, Focus Inbox, has, Focus Inbox has come to all of those other outlooks, except for the Windows Mail app, which is part of Windows 10. And that's what's changing uh, this month. Um, some people were testing it privately. They've expanded that group pretty dramatically. Even in the public build, the shipping build of Windows 10, if you go into the Mail app, go into Settings, go to Reading, way down at the bottom, you will see an item down there for Focus Inbox. It has to be enabled in your account, which is how they're limiting mm -hmm. its access. So for me, I, I don't have access to it yet anywhere because the accounts I would use with Windows Mail have not been enabled for this. But it's coming anytime now. So I think by the time the creator's update is out, it's probably fair to say this thing will be generally available basically in every Outlook that there is, <laughs> if that makes sense. Okay, so this Except is Except... Oh, here we go. Do you know they <laughs> delayed it? They delayed the rollout in many of these versions. Oh, I did not know that. Okay. Yeah. So on the Mac, um, this mm -hmm. happened like in January, they acknowledged this and they said on the Mac, rollout will be six to eight weeks after first release completes oh. on Office 365. Um, okay. On Outlook.com, that they are now saying it won't happen until April, I believe, oh, for geez. people. Okay. Yeah. Well, so I got so excited there. <laughs> I know, but but the version yeah. you're talking about is the one that's built into Windows 10. Yes. On PCs, right? So that one yep. is happening. It's Windows 10 happening. Mobile, yeah, also delayed. So I, um, I, I think the thing that's notable about this, although I didn't know anything that you, <laughs> that stuff you just said was new to me, but yeah. the uh, they talked about this last year and they talked about a schedule. And they, they yep. whatever the schedule was at the time, it could have changed, obviously. But they kind of yep. laid it out for every single version of Outlook, except for the Mail app in Windows 10. They, they didn't even right. mention it. And so, yep. of, course, a lot, of course, a lot of people are like, wait, wait, what's going on with this? I mean, this is the one I use. So it is actually happening right now. That's pretty cool. In fact, I should look at it yep. now. I, I would imagine it's possible. Yeah I, just, yeah. yeah, I just sent you the new schedule. The schedule got pushed back okay. for quite a yeah, few people. Know. Yeah, it says this but, setting can't be applied to any of your accounts. <laughs> but it's there. I mean, the feature's in there. I just can't access it. Yeah, yeah. You know, okay. I, the only reason I don't love this feature is I don't, I feel like I don't get enough mail to um, make it worth it for me. I think if you get a yeah. ton of mail, it's probably worth turning this on. Uh, but for me, I noticed when it was on, the mail, I was missing some mail and it was in this, it was in my, what do they call it? Your junk folder or whatever. Oh, the, yeah, the other, the other folder, yeah. 
Yeah. Right. And so I'm yeah, like, like oh. it never really learns. And that's the right. problem. If you just glance your email, which I do, like you probably like basically all day long. Yeah. It, it, it what it gives you is two places to look, you know, because right. you can't, especially at first, you're not going to trust it. I know. So you have to look in both places and it just becomes yeah. maybe more of a. Right. And if you don't trust it and then it can't learn, so it stays bad, like it never improves. Right. So, yeah, I don't know. You, you can turn it off. <laughs> and I do. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people do like Brad does too. Yeah. 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 It's nice to have options. It's nice when you can turn them off if you don't want them. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you don't have to. It's yeah. the same thing. It's very similar to this priority inbox that Google does. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and some th people love it. Some people hate mm -hmm. it. Yeah, yeah, right. And there's a feature consolidation happening across all these outlooks, right? Which is kind of interesting. Uh, Microsoft <laughs> had a, um, like an anti, I guess it was an anti-spam kind of thing, uh, whose name now escapes me, that has been replaced by this clutter feature, which debuted in Exchange and is now kind of everywhere because everything's based yeah. on Exchange now. And that f that's been freaking people out too because I think people get mm -hmm. used to the way whatever that Outlook.com feature was called. Yeah. Which was similar, whatever it was called. Um, yeah, there was, there's also get, Conversation View. That's not the one yeah. you mean, right? No, but that's another classic where it's yeah. probably split right down the middle. Some people love it and some people are like, nope. <laughs> you yep. know, they, they want nothing I don't like to do it. With. I can't, yeah. I can't get used to it, but other people are like, I can't live without Conversation View, which groups your emails together that per pertain yeah. to each other. Yeah, I hate uh, it too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. See, I actually like, conversation yeah, but, 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 yeah, different yeah. strokes yeah. everybody yeah. email is about as personal an app as you can get i mean really it yep. Is. yep yeah so they have all this stuff and you can turn it on and turn it off and that's cool that's fair yep that's fine uh, well but the problem though over time is that they they also have like 117 different outlook clients right and so I the <laughs> the features that were available in each were kind of up and down and and what yeah. we've seen since the Accompli team came over and basically took over Outlook is that they're kind of smoothing that out. And so mm -hmm. it sounds like the schedule has been pushed back, which is too bad, but at least they're doing that. And the theory should be that if you choose to use Windows Mail on the desktop, or maybe you just use the web client, or you go to mobile and you're using an iPhone or whatever, it shouldn't matter. Like you should have the mm -hmm. same choice of features where they make sense, right? Across all of those clients. Right. And they should look and work similarly and uh, it seems like they're doing a good job of making that happen. It's going to take a while, but um, they are moving in that direction. Uh, cloud? Cloudy? Oh, wait, wait, wait a minute. No, news? no. Insider Sorry. builds. Sorry. You want to do that? Yeah. 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 Sorry. D um, Donna Sarkar just tweeted today, there are no Windows 10 insider builds today. But she didn't say there wouldn't be any later this week, <laughs> which I bet there will. <laughs> None today, but some tomorrow. They're working on yeah. dynamic lock. <laughs> we've got right. we've got priorities. Hopefully, right. dynamic. But they're unlock. getting close to the thing they hate to call RTM. So they're you know they had the bug bash over the weekend, and they're trying to get the last right. things resolved before they declare it done, which they won't yep. officially say because they don't want to say it ever RTMs. It never does in their words. So, <laughs> but it will. So yeah. <laughs> Paul, sorry, sorry. oh ye of little faith. It's so dry <clears throat> during the winter. <laughs> uh, let's talk about the cloud. Amazon, yes, yeah, so and their what, new uh, what do they call it? Hive, Chime, Chime, Chime. Chime. <laughs> Leah, you might so want to look into this. No, yeah, I actually so immediately said we should look into this. That's what I said. Yep. Yeah. AWS now, uh, Amazon Web Services has a thing that is competing with Skype for Business and WebEx and GoToMeeting, some of these other products. Uh, it's called Chime. They announced it this week. So they call it their uni unified communication service. And they are selling a basic edition um, that's free, a plus edition for $250 a month per user. And a pro edition for fifteen dollars a month. So if you're wondering why is Amazon doing this, Amazon's <laughs> trying to do what Microsoft and Google are doing, which is not just sell infrastructure as a service, you know, where you can put your stuff in a virtual machine. They want to have business services that you buy from them too, and that you buy on a subscription basis. So this joins some other services they have. They have Work Docs and Work Mail uh, productivity services on AWS. So here's another one: the Chime service. Let me, can I ask you a question about this? Because yes. uh, we have 
not just we specifically us, but we collectively just as a industry have watched as Microsoft and Google have tried to attack AWS with their own mm-hmm. similar cloud services, like it's kind of infrastructure yep. services, right. plumbing essentially. Mm-hmm. And so far they haven't been super successful. It's not that they haven't created their own businesses. I mean, Azure is obviously a big deal and Google mm-hmm. is not, but whatever, they're, but they're trying. It's weird to me, It's at least for me, and I, it's, the question really is whether to you this occurred to you, that we've really never had a discussion about Amazon attacking the same thing from the other direction. In other words, they have mm-hmm. this infrastructure service. What they don't mm-hmm. have are the end user business services that kind of sit on top of that, which is what Microsoft and Google both do have. So when mm-hmm. they announced this, I, th- I was my first reaction was, this is really surprising. I never saw this coming. But mm-hmm. my second thought was, why did I never see this coming? Right. You know, retrospectively, <laughs> it's so obvious. Yeah. You know, they don't want to just be plumbing, just like Verizon right. doesn't want to just be plumbing. No. You know? Right. Hey, before you, one thing about AWS, they are, should mention on this show, they are a sponsor, believe it or not. So, a uh, little disclaimer there AWS is a sponsor, but I still want to use this uh, thing, this service. Um, if you think about this, they, Microsoft and Amazon came at the cloud from two totally different ways. When yeah. Amazon came at the cloud, they well, they were there first, right? They were there like seven years before anybody else really was. And right. they started out as an infrastructure as a service provider because they had all this cloud capacity and they're like, hey, we, we built all this cloud stuff for our commerce business, so we should make some right. more money on it and sure. you know, basically get users to host their stuff in our cloud. Microsoft, when they built Azure, came at it the opposite way. So they're like, oh, we have all this business software. So let's build a platform as a service and make it for people who want to build their apps from scratch um, and make them completely um, cloud first from the get-go. And it wasn't that successful for Microsoft at the beginning. So then they added the infrastructure as a service. So it's like the two of them came at it from opposite ends. And now they're going to go head to head. Yeah. I mean, you just mentioned what work mail. Is that what you said? Yeah, it's Uh, called... um, I know. I don't. I don't know their services as well I as I never, know. Microsoft. I've never heard of it. I've just work never heard docs of it. and work mail. Yep. Okay. So these are obviously email and web web based right. document and whatever. I, I have never heard of those services. There's, you know, they're new. Yeah. They're they're pretty new. They're just starting to try to establish themselves in these spaces. So they're not as well so, known as things like Google Docs, right? Yeah. Or I, well, Ops. AWS is so well regarded. So right. well regarded. Right. Um, you have to think this stuff is probably going to do okay. Um, it's very interesting. Like, I mean, I don't know yeah. that, you know, Microsoft has been ki- fighting kind of a two pronged battle. They've got the productivity mm-hmm. end where they're going after Google and vice versa. And then they have that infrastructure part where they were kind of going after or are going after Amazon. Well, surprise, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's, uh, it's this two front war is being fought in both directions. Yep. And it is. that's really interesting. And again, I, I feel I mean, somewhat dumb that this never occurred to me that this would happen. Yeah, I guess I guess if you think about it, if you're if you're the vendor, right? You're like, okay, I've saturated the I uh, infrastructure as a service market. Like we've sold the yeah. heck out of this, and we're doing really well. Where can we sure. get some more incremental value? Well, we're not really doing anything in in the business software slash productivity enterprise space. So let's try mm-hmm. to go get some of that. And they must see the businesses that are built off their services and how gangbusters some of them are going. Right. And the thought must be, we we should get part of this. They're just piggybacking yep. on us. Let's just do this ourselves. Yeah, yeah. totally. <laughs> it's interesting. Yep. And that dovetails into the other cloud um, yeah. thing that I put in the show notes. Uh, so this is an interesting thing that Microsoft's doing that I don't, I don't believe either Amazon or Google is doing this as well, but I'm not positive. Um, But I remember two years ago when I was talking to Mark Rusinovich, who's the CTO of Azure, he started talking to me about Microsoft's idea of they wanted to blur the lines between IaaS and PaaS, you know, infrastructure and platform. And I was like, I don't know what that means, but yeah, sounds great, right? (laughs) (laughs) My reaction to everything, Azure. Yeah, yes. Right, right. So I never really understood what that meant until they started rolling out some of the services that are doing this. And what it meant was they're going to take some of the platform as a service capabilities that they have for people who are building brand new apps on Azure. And they're going to bring those services 
to people who are only using IaaS, um, their VMs on Azure. So one of the first things they brought over was a service called Virtual Machine Scale Sets. Um, they announced this last year and I was like, oh yeah, whatever, okay. Let's users create thousands of identical virtual machines so they can scale their big jobs quicker um, if they want to use IS. Like, yeah, okay. Now they're starting to roll out more of these things. So last week they talked about managed disks as another service that they took from their platform as a service and they're making it available to people who are only using infrastructure as a service. Not only, but like also using and um, in their blog post about this, they said, this is just the start, right? Like now we're going to take yeah. a whole bunch of the stuff we did as platform as a service and make them available to IaaS customers. So they were going to bring over patching support, application lifestyle, uh, lifestyle, <laughs> application lifecycle, integration, health monitoring, load balancing. All these things are going to be available to you, whether you use platform as a service or infrastructure as a service. I think... Um, this is going to be really big for customers because some of them only want to be in the IaaS part of Microsoft's cloud. Some have things in both sides and it looks and works better if you have the same services available to you, whichever part of the cloud you're using. It fits in with their whole hybrid play, right? So I think this is this could be something that distinguishes them from the other cloud players, but I'm not 100% sure if either Amazon or Google is trying this too. So in, I think it's interesting though, because it's something I remember Mark's talking to me about two years ago and I'm like, but what does that mean? Blurring the lines. Okay, like, what are you trying to do? I don't get it. <laughs> and I wasn't sure if he meant, um, well, I, I just didn't know. I, I kind of was at a loss. And and the more I asked him to explain it, even though he's a great guy for explaining things, I was just getting more lost. So now we kind of have a clearer picture of this, I think. And I think it's a pretty interesting play. And... A way, I think, for Microsoft, too, to take people who have been very um, kind of skeptical of the cloud and only kind of dipping their toes in the virtual machines to convince right. them, hey, you tried this capability here, but we have it over in the platform as a service, too. So it's almost like a bridge to get them to try both parts of their cloud and maybe ultimately go paths. Hey, Mikey, he likes it. <laughs> I need a whiteboard. I don't know what I would do. Oh, with I, it. we get, you know, we used to have a little small whiteboard, you know, just one you yeah. could hold up like that and, and you could draw. Yeah. And you'd have to draw really yeah. small. Like cloud, pass, or IAS. If you only mm -hmm. had like right. some sort of device that you could <laughs> tablet right. I know, and draw. I, I, I know I've asked you who this person was at least 100 times, but that guy that was on. I think the site or maybe Tech TV in the early days. Oh, Cliff Stoll. His, yeah, he was yeah, so great. He draw on his yeah. monitor. Yeah, on his Mac monitor. <laughs> I, every time he did it, I was like, you know, because he was using dry erase markers, but it looked like he was putting a Sharpie on the screen, and it was just always he was so a awful. physics professor, yeah. I think. So that's the kind of yeah. thing physics professors do. Yeah, he was yeah. an yeah. insane person in the off season. Mm, even on the on season. Um, <laughs> all right, Xbox. We got some big Xbox news. Yes, we do. Uh, Record sales. Record. Record sales. Record January for Microsoft. Still came in second place. <laughs> oh, <crap. laughs> like, oh, I know crap. it's unbelievable. I, I don't. The thing that confuses me here, aside from the obvious, is I don't look. The PlayStation Four is fine. There's nothing wrong with it, but it's not twice as good as the Xbox One. Um, they're roughly the same, and I, I, if this thing was split sixty forty, I'd be okay with that. The, the fact that the PlayStation 4 is outselling Xbox One by over two to one is just confusing to me. Um, they've clearly sold somewhere in the 25 million-ish range. So it's not like this thing isn't selling well. In fact, it's selling better than the Xbox 360 did at this point in its own life cycle. So it's not like it's not a success. But this it's weird how this sales disparity has been hanging over our heads, so to speak, basically the entire time the Xbox One has been out. And it just continued in January. So this is obviously going to be a big year for the Xbox. There's a thing later in the notes here about uh, an E3 briefing uh, that Microsoft is having on Sunday, June 11th, where there's a picture of what is the Scorpio logic board. So That's clearly exciting. this is... Yeah, I want to know more about yeah. Scorpio. Scorpio, yeah. what they said, was this summer? 
Uh, probably more like holiday season. Holidays. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Xbox One S launched in August, so I suppose right. earlier than the holidays would yeah. be possible. In fact, that would be really nice, but I would think the holidays, yeah. Don't you think the name Scorpio implies, you know, Scorp late or, October? When is Scorpio? November? Scorpio. Oh, see, talk yeah, to yeah, like yeah, I, I was yeah, originally, yeah, yeah. It's, mm -hmm. it's technically, I think it's probably Ask, November now. It's, a, it's our new segment, Ask the Astrologer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. yeah. How do you Astrology feel about pick of the week. Of, yeah. <laughs> well, Scorpios can be a picky kind of a game console. Easy to <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. They didn't call it Scorpion. <laughs> yeah, it is Scorpio. Yeah. And then they'll never use that name because they always use terrible names. So we'll see what they call it. Yeah, the Hopefully one. they call it the Xbox One 2. That would be hilarious. <laughs> uh, I bet they call it something like Xbox One Xbox 4K. 10. Xbox 10, yeah. They Doesn't that make sense? It, is, yourself it would be smart to wait till September because I did just buy the 1S and you got to give me a little time to <laughs> yep. amortize yep. my investment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fair. I'm, not, I'm not like Paul where I have 18 Xboxes. <laughs> <laughs> I do have three Xbox One ones in my house That's right now. Ridiculous. I'd have four, <laughs> but my son is away at college. <laughs> he took one. I Yeah, I know. Little bastard. Anyway, um, <laughs> so <laughs> you probably kill me now with his bare hands. Anyway, uh, this a small it. note. Um, Call of Duty, best-selling game in the world. Yep. Uh, you mean Call of Duty? <laughs> Call of Duty. Yeah, I was interested to see, you know, I've had bad reactions, or as I call them, visceral reactions, uh, mm -hmm. to two of the recent Call of Duty games. And um, this last one, I, I just, I don't even play it. I just, I play the the Modern Warfare Remastered, and apparently I'm not alone. <laughs> so they're going to uh, go back to the basics for the next version of the game. So maybe Mary Jo could, uh, you know, be Let's interested. Let's not press again. our I'll luck it. here. <laughs> <laughs> I still have a dream that someday I will be sniped from some hidden location and I'll look down to see who it was and it'll me. say, Mary Jo. Hey, I'll I'm, say I'm, I'm watching point. Twitter uh, live right now and there's a, an ad for an HP Elite phone. Oh, wow. Yeah. Apparently the Twitter live stream is currently being run by something called Cheddar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cheddar. I know. Boy. I've heard of that. Cheddar. Yeah. It's like a news channel. I don't get yeah. it. Cheddar. Oh, now they're doing yeah. a... Oh, no, this is the news. We're back to the news. I thought it was a Vive ad. Oh, you're looking at like a like the... You know, when you go happening. to Twitter now, if you go to the front page of Twitter, uh, you get a live stream. Yeah. Everyone wants like... to be Facebook. Oh, God. I don't <laughs> yeah. want it. Facebook just announced that they're going to have video play audio when Automatic you go Automatic playing. Oh, God, the worst. Hooray! I, I think, having read the uh, report, it's only on mobile. So... But they didn't say that. But I'm, 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 I think I'm correctly interpreting it. That's just when you're using your phone. Mm. Okay. So dopey. <laughs> dopey, dopey. I have a very visceral, visceral. relationship. <laughs> with uh, you sort of sound like, you know, like a little bit like, uh, what was that guy's name? Oh, that awesome guy that used to be at the roast that was always supposedly yeah, drunk. Do, do you know, Dean Martin. Oh, Foster Brooks, who just passed. No, Foster Brooks, thank you. He was yeah. amazing. Actually, he didn't just pass. Erwin yeah. Corey just passed. Yeah, I confuse Foster Brooks and Erwin Corey. Same generation, regulars on yeah. Johnny uh, Carson. Yeah, those are the best. <laughs> those are the days. Uh, COD going back to basics. Okay, and then June eleventh. That's, That's it. Yep. Hey, That's it. Hey, we've See, come to the. Quick. It was we're ready for painless. the back of the book. It's the end of the yeah. Xbox segment. Mary Jo, wake up! <laughs> <laughs> wake up! I'm awake. I'm making waffles. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit before we get on to the back of the book about Amazon Web Services. I shouldn't have to really say much about AWS. Everybody knows AWS. But I'm, if you don't, let me just prod you a little bit. It's a, uh, it's a robust, scalable platform. We use it. I use it all the time that helps builders of all kinds, all sizes, innovate quickly. Twice the compliance certifications. The largest global footprint. Global of any other cloud vendor. And what's great is they do all the heavy infrastructure lifting so so you could focus on the thing you want to do. And I always tell the story, but I, I know so many people who, you know, in the in the late part of the century or early part of the 2000s were starting up, you know, something, an app or a web page or like Kevin Rose starting Dig. 
And in those days, man, it was a pain. You had to go, you know, rent a server. He had a colo. So he had, a, he had a network operations center where you buy your own hardware. So he bought this big old server. And I remember he was so excited installing this thing. <laughs> and you look back on this and you go, man, how do we survive? Now you literally just, you know, go online, flip a switch, and bada bing, bada boom. And you AWS, you've got everything you, you could need. And they release new features all the time. In fact, a faster rate than anyone else. A thousand new features last year alone. Services support virtually any cloud workload, more than 70 of them, to range from compute and storage and networking and database and analytics, application services, deployment management, mobile. Almost everybody uses, you know, back end, like for your mobile app, image servers, that kind of thing. It's amazing what you can do. We use, uh, actually, AWS as a front end to give us load balancing and uh, DDoS protection. It's, it's just Amazon's storage solutions are designed, as you know, to deliver secure, scalable, durable storage for businesses of any size. If you want to achieve efficiency and scalability within their backup and recovery environments without the need for an on-prem infrastructure, that's kind of the whole point of AWS. Do all the stuff you would do on-prem on their servers. Make life easier podcast at aws they have a podcast uh of course they do talking about aws so you can listen and learn about aws and and it is totally global man i mean uh they're the widest global reach of any cloud provider you could choose the region your data does, resides in so you minimize latency and costs and nowadays you know regulatory requirements mean sometimes you have to have a server in specific regions or countries you got it. You got complete control of your data. With AWS, startups scale like enterprises. And enterprises can be nimble as startups. Whether you're new to AWS or you've already used it, as most of us have, they want to give you all the information you need to support your success and help you do amazing things. Learn more at podcast.aws. Podcast.aws. Amazon Web Services. We thank them so much for... Not only their support of this show, but, you, you know, changing how work gets done over the last decade. We're talking Windows. Paul Thorat, Mary Jo Foley, and it's time for what we call the back of the book. Paul Thorat will start it off with his tip of the week. Yeah, I had a, a reader email me last week and say, hey, um, I know that Windows to go is a feature only of Windows 10 Enterprise. But if you look in Windows 10 Pro, it's there. Did Microsoft change their policy for this? You know, what's going on? And so Windows to go is that feature where you can install Windows 10 onto a USB key as a, like a portable OS, like you can do with Linux or whatever. Um, it is a, a perk of Windows 10 Enterprise. You need to have a Windows 10 Enterprise license to use this. And to my knowledge, Microsoft had never changed its policy with regards to that. So I asked and then I waited and I asked and I waited and they kept sending me information about the the feature, which I already knew and, and didn't really answer the question. So I had Raphael look at it and we've developed a theory uh, uh, between us and the reader, actually, that Microsoft, uh, this that this is a mistake, <laughs> that it is, in fact, available in Windows 10 Pro. You do still need enterprise, meaning you can't make a portable version of Windows um, 10 Pro. Um, it's possible that if it was done on purpose, it's because enterprises have mixed environments where some computers will be on enterprise, some will be on pro, and they just wanted to make sure everyone could make the key. Um, but the other details of this haven't changed, meaning uh, it only works with certain types of specially formulated USB keys. There's literally a small list of devices that work. They tend to be more expensive than typical uh, USB keys. And you can only apply Windows 10 Enterprise to it. So you need a license for that, which, of course, no individuals have. So if you have Windows 10 Pro and you go into the control panel and you search for Windows to go, you will see it there. You will not be able to use it. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> however, if you were, if you need to use this in a business, do know that you can create these disks using Windows, to, uh, Windows 10 Pro as well as Enterprise. Um, and just a quick note, I, I wrote a story today about Verizon's new unlimited data plans. Um, I'm not going to be switching to Verizon, but I do find it very interesting that as kind of an ongoing trend, the big wireless carriers in the United States, meaning AT&T and Verizon, have pretty consistently been following along as T-Mobile and Sprint and even things like Google Project Fi 
have introduced these kind of innovative new features like, in, you know, international plans that are fairly inexpensive and uh, that kind of thing. And Verizon this week uh, basically did the pigs fly kind of thing and they brought back their unlimited data plan. And it's actually it's actually a pretty good deal. Um, and it's, you know, they're, they have that kind of high end throttling thing like everyone does. But basically you have to you have to use like 22 gigabytes in a month before they'll potentially throttle you. And even then, they probably won't. So, um, I hate Verizon and I hate AT and T, but they're making it a little harder to hate them, I guess. So that's kind of cool. Um, just, uh, you know, Lisa's going back to Verizon just because of this, because she's been on T Mobile. Yeah, I, I looked at it. Um, the rest of my family is on Verizon, and we we have four users on uh, because Steph, my wife's parents are on there too. And I I told her, if you have four users, the cost of this plan is forty five dollars per month per user. Um, I said, you, you might want to look at your last couple of bills and do the math on this because whatever their data allotment is, it, it's a hard limit. So if you can go unlimited and not have to worry about it, especially with my son yeah. who tends to abuse data, like, you know, like a teenager I'm sticking would. with T-Mobile. I think it's still the best deal. If the connection is good, you know, if yeah. they have good service where you are, I, I think T-Mobile yeah. is. Yeah, 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 yeah. And what's interesting is they're responding to Verizon by improving, you know, by giving you tethering and stuff. And so it's yep. it's really interesting. It work, kind of works Competition is yeah. great, you know. Yep. Yeah, you can see it right. I know it's amazing. So uh, I always think back to that first summer when the iPhone came out and I switched to AT&T and it was like 2G Edge kind of connectivity. Not Edge. Edge? Edge? Was yeah. It called edge? Yeah. Yeah, Edge. It's 2G. And uh, we went to France that summer and I was afraid to turn it on because... The iPhone didn't even have a sense of like oh, roaming, oh, let oh, alone no. international. Thousands roaming. of dollars, and people yeah. were coming home with twenty seven hundred dollar yeah. bills, you yeah. know, and 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 yeah. not not to mention you get a paper bill in the yep. mail that was like half a foot tall. So yeah, Justine uh, skipped, Justine made her name opening her uh, first yeah, yeah, iPhone yeah. bill. <laughs> so uh, things have changed, um, and that's you know that's neat. So anyway, Verizon's still the devil, but I I but good for them. Uh, yeah. So but they're a cheaper devil Verizon. now. It, that's good. yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's unlimited good. unlimited deviltry. <laughs> <laughs> the unlimited double, yeah. Uh, and then the app pick of the week, this is a Microsoft Garage app that kind of just silently appeared this week. It's a little goofy. It's called uh, Email Insights. It's actually a Windows Store app. This should qualm some of the complaints we've seen lately about uh, e um, garage apps only being on Android and iOS. It connects to either Gmail or um, Outlook 2016. And what it basically does is it works like, um, what's it called, Spotlight in Mac OS X where you kind of hit the, Command space bar and, you know, the thing comes up in the middle of the screen. It works like that, except it does instant email searching. And it's supposed to offer, like, dramatically better and faster search than what's available, especially in Outlook, which, you know, is a Microsoft problem. Um, I do use Gmail, so I, I tried this, and I, I honestly, I think Gmail web-based uh, searching is fantastic. So I, didn't, I don't really see the, the point of this. But if you are using Outlook on Windows, meaning Outlook 2016... Um, you might want to look at this because Outlook is terrible and you should not be using Outlook 2016 on Windows, but I know you are. <laughs> so this is much better searching than what's available on Outlook. And hopefully uh, this technology will kind of make its way from Microsoft Research, which is what this is, um, to Outlook, you know, somewhere down the road. Or they just get rid of Outlook. Either way would be fine. <laughs> Come on. Boy, Why I are you didn't such know, an Outlook hater? No kidding. I didn't know you had this. Outlook 2016. I, the funny thing is, everything else that's called Outlook, I actually really like. Outlook Except Mobile the real is fantastic. Outlook client. Mm. Yep. Outlook.com is great. Uh, Outlook on the web is great. Mm. Outlook 2016. It makes me want to gouge up my eyeballs. Yeah. It's terrible. I've actually always mm. felt that way, but it's just too much. It's yeah. just so much stuff for yeah. something that should be streamlined and simple. Yeah. Just depends what you want. Yeah. What you're looking for. I want something that works. That's silly. <laughs> Why would you want that? <laughs> Time for the Enterprise Pick of the Week. Yes, Enterprise Pick of the Week this week is Azure Stack. Um, Azure Stack is the version of Azure that customers are going to be able to run in their own data centers so that they can deliver Azure services from their data centers, not from Microsoft's. And up until, um, I think it was early this week, Microsoft had had kind of had a reset of their strategy with Azure Stack. And they said, instead of letting you bring your own hardware, we're going to just pick three server vendors and we're going to make their machines into appliances. And that's how we're going to sell you Azure Stack when it comes out later this year. 
So a lot of people were grumbling about that and saying, oh, only HPE or Dell or Lenovo, no, no other servers. Well, they've just added a fourth. So now that you can also opt for Cisco's Unified Computing System, UCS, as the fourth option when Azure Stack comes out. Um, right now, Azure Stack's in preview two. And Microsoft had said that Azure Stack will be out. Well, at first it was supposed to be out last year. Now it's supposed to be out sometime in 2017, around mid-year, I believe. But Cisco said their server preloaded with Azure Stack will be out sometime between Q3 and Q4 of 2017. So I'm guessing that's the new timing for Azure Stack. Uh, but the good news is you have four choices instead of three. Azure Stack still coming this year. That's the enterprise pick. And uh, do you have a code name for us to name? I do. And I want to hear Paul's take on this code name because this is a <laughs> weird code name um, in that a lot of people disagree what this is the code name for. So I um, this this week is .NET's 15th anniversary. What, really? .NET's been out 15 years. Wow. Yeah. So I was trying to find the code name for the very first version of .NET. And mm. I did a lot of searching around the web. And I saw some people say it was Lightning. And I saw some people say it was Project 42. And I saw some people say it was both of those things. Mm. Um, I don't recall either of those. I do recall I that other thing that you have here. Yep. So Project 42. Well, and then some people called it NGWS, Next Generation Windows Services. Yeah, that, that's, that was definitely a thing. Um, that was a thing, yep. Oh, yeah, so yeah, no, that's... I, you remember Project 42, right? Like, I remember this being a code name for Microsoft back in the day, and a lot of people assumed that 42 was from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, you know, the right. answer to the ultimate question of life, universe, and everything is 42, and that's why they made that the code name. But then other people said the reason it was 42 was because Microsoft's developer division was in building 42 on the Microsoft campus, or maybe it was both. But what, yeah, um, why was it building 42? Was it the 42nd building? Project four uh, oh, it. man. Hmm. Have you, well, Microsoft building numbers on their campus are a nightmare. Um, I was going to say, please don't pretend that that makes any not sense. Sequential. I wasn't sure yeah. what you were going to say. Yeah. But, okay. They're not sequential. Yeah. There um, they're are buildings missing. Uh, there are buildings next to each other that are totally different numbers. So unless you have a map like I do, a secret treasure map, you it's do? tough to get around. The <laughs> ah. <Yep. laughs> so yeah, I, I will say this. Map. I... I I have multiple examples map, right? of me writing about NGWS. I, I have nothing okay. about those other things. Yeah, I remember Project 42. I think Lightning, some people also said was the code name for COM+. Plus. Um, some people said it was the code name for CLR. We need Raymond Chen, basically, to tell us what, what the real meaning of these code I names were. I feel like but I should know. I feel like I should know, too. Do, so Com if plus. anybody who's listening knows for sure what the original code name was for .NET Framework 1.0, we would love to know. Because that, that is what I wanted to make the code name pick of the week. But you got some others in there. Lightning, Project 42, and GWS. A mishmash. Speaking of Raymond Chen. Yes. Yeah. Did you read his most recent blog post? Oh, no, Which this one's well, from November. This is an old one. I, I just, was going to say, yeah, no, the most recent one was going to bore us all to death. Yeah, um, but the, yeah, the, the I, one yeah. of, man, this housing downturn is hitting. No, no, not that one. Uh, the, <laughs> one the one about uh, William, the the customer service rep. It was. I, I guess I, I just saw it on uh, Hacker News or Reddit or somewhere. Yeah. And that's why I'm aware of it. But now that I look at the, the date, it's November 23rd, <laughs> 2009. So you guys, this is old. You've seen this all before. But yeah. it was the if one any, about. If anyone, yeah, he does, he has a great blog. It's called the Old yeah. New Thing. If you haven't read it before. <laughs> so yeah, so what he just talks about all sorts of Microsofty kind of. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's a lot like, of little neat internal. Yeah. Bits, you know. He's he's like the unofficial, or maybe even the official historian from Microsoft. He knows everything. He, uh, so I'm I'm sorry. I've been researching this NG, NGWS thing. Do you remember Windows Distributed Internet Applications 2000 or Win Win DNA 2000? Yeah, I do remember that. I jeez, I forgot about this. <laughs> it's amazing how much stuff. So uh, crazy. I it's I crazy. I guess since everybody this is this is such an old post. No, which one? Which one was it? Can I talk to that William fellow? He was so helpful. <laughs> I don't remember that one. So in 1989, 
Bill Gates was being taken on a guided tour of the product support department's new office building. And during his visit, he said, hey, you mind if I take this call? <laughs> so, That's Bill, awesome. this is Raymond writing. Bill puts on a headset, sits down and answers the phone. Hello, this is Microsoft product support. William speaking. How can I help you? Bill talks with the customer, collects the details of the problem, searches in the product support knowledge base, sifts through the search results, finds the solution, and patiently walks the customer through fixing the problem. The customer <laughs> is thrilled that William was able to fix the problem so quickly and with such a pleasant attitude. Bill wraps up the call, and thank you That's for using great. Microsoft products. At no point did Bill identify himself as anything other than William. The customer had no idea the product support engineer who took the call was Bill Gates, but the story doesn't end there. Everybody in the department, you know, within days knows that the time Bill took a product support call. Sometime later, the same customer calls back and says, <laughs> Hi, I called you folks with a problem some time ago, and I talked to a nice guy named William who straightened it all out. Can I have another, I have another question? Can I speak with William? Awesome. <laughs> product support engineer says, well, Okay, let me see if William's available. Brings up the customer's service record, looks at the name of the support engineer who entered the earlier call, and it's Bill G. Amen. That's amazing. Um, sorry, but William's not available right now. His friends call him Bill, by the way. The person who helped you last time, that was Bill Gates. <laughs> the customer goes, oh, my God. <laughs> kind of a nice story. That and now true. now that I, you know, it's from Raymond Chen, that, you know, that's very credible, right? I'm sure it happened. Very. Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But that's not unusual. CEOs often take uh, <laughs> customer support calls. Uh, Mary Jo, you have sent me down a rabbit hole. Uh -oh. Sorry. Have you I, found I more? No, yeah, I this I didn't write this, but in 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 the year 2000 at Windows IT Pro, we were of course trying to figure out what the heck .net was, right? And everyone was writing all this stuff about DLL hell and XML, oh, yeah. which oh, was yeah. new to us at the time and this notion that you'd be able to install snippets of code over the internet and run them on your computer. Mm -hmm. It was all very exciting and different and new. But th listen to what Krista Anderson, who, by the way, now works for Microsoft, <laughs> wrote in the year 2000 as part of this story about .NET. She said, XML applications will not replace Windows applications anytime soon. Inertia, inertia, if nothing else, will prevent that. People are used to Windows applications. Developers are used to developing for Windows and very reasonably don't like the idea of starting over with a new platform. It's just too early to tell how well XML applications will stand up to wide scale deployment. <laughs> this is literally, literally the problem we are having right now with the Windows Store, that, wow. which is what those things are, XML applications. Right? Yeah. Yep. That's amazing. Wow. That was 17 Some years ago. Some things never change. Yep. <laughs> 17 years ago. Wow. Incredible. All right. I think uh, we've all earned... A uh, little stein of something. Yeah, and she finally yes. picked a good beer. Sorry, that sounded <laughs> finally. <little bad>. Finally, <laughs> I've been trying to have mercy on you because you haven't been drinking beer. But sorry this for is this. Clearly, beer pick. a hop-free beer. I've been checking in little um, dollops of beer, like <laughs> some of them have a beer, and I'll, I'll put like a little Dixie cup Aww. amount. Just like, you check Aww. it in. You shouldn't check it in unless it's a. Hey, a this is what I got. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you can do now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, this week. It's a big beer. That's the beer pick of the week. It's from Neba Nebraska Brewing in Papillon, Nebraska. Nice. They are a really great brewery, if you've never had anything from Nebraska Brewing. And they make a barley wine called Fathead. Probably because you get a fat kind of head if you drink too much of it. Um, this beer is not light. It's 12%. Um, it's a scotch ale aged six months in whiskey barrels. I got to have some last week. If you it like butterscotch, so it tastes just like butterscotch. That is exactly what I can't consume in one bottle. What? <laughs> they um, put brown sugar in it to boost the oh alcohol content. So God. it gives it a very caramely, molasses-y oh, yeah. kind Does it of have thing. A like a sugar grain feel to it all? Like it's no, it doesn't. It's good. very smooth. Yeah. Yeah. You mean like graininess? Yeah. I've had some some, some, like some barley yeah. wines yeah. are so sugary. Yeah. You you get the texture of sugar grains in the in the liquid. Yeah, I don't love that. Mm -mm. So. Yeah. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, low on the on the IBUs, so not very hoppy. It does have some hops, but um mostly this is just a delicious, dark, heavy winter beer. <laughs> it's good.
And it's fat yeah. head. And I, I can't, I could, if I even tasted that, I'd probably go to like a metabolic shock. You might. <laughs> I know. I, I, I haven't. You haven't had really any sugar. carbs in a long time? Not beyond incidental carbs. I mean, good for you. It, it like two and a half months. How's that been? It's good, right? Well, you know, it's hell. It's hell. It's <laughs> you don't miss it. <laughs> no, Come on. No, no, it's okay. No, it's okay. You actually, don't miss the funny it. The thing is, I, I actually eat a lot less. Like I, yeah. I sugar I makes you eat more. Day. Sugar makes yeah, you eat more. It's really interesting. And uh, yeah. and once you don't eat it for a while, then you have something with sugar. It's like, whoa, that is yeah, it's, sweet. It's, whoa, it could, ooh. Yeah, I remember that from before. I haven't I haven't had anything sugary, but this beer would kill me. There's no doubt about it. It would. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but I love barley. Barley wine beers were that was my basically my favorite kind of. beer. I love them too. I agree. Yeah, they're delish. The yeah. source of all my problems. All right, kids. <laughs> go go have some butterscotch flavored beer and <laughs> yum. Uh, we'll see you in a week. Have a little piece of steak. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Paul Thorat, Mary Jo Foley, thank you for being here. Paul and uh, Mary Jo are, of course, the premier Windows and Microsoft journalists in the world. You'll find Mary Jo Foley at allaboutmicrosoft.com. That's her blog, a ZDNet blog. Uh, Paul Thorat, you'll find at his website, T-H-U-R-O-T-T.com, or on his book site, leanpub.com. And, uh, of course, they both appear here every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time. What would that be? That would be 1900 UTC if you want to tune in and watch live and join us in the chat room at irc.twit.tv. We'd love to have you. Otherwise, though, you can get the on-demand versions, too. We have audio and video. And uh, that's available uh, wherever you get your podcasts. If you want to just do it from our website, twit.tv slash www. But we're on YouTube and Stitcher and Slacker and Google and, oh, everywhere. Just subscribe. That way you won't miss an episode. And we will see you for episode 506 next week on Windows Weekly. Bye-bye.